Hi, uh, very good morning to everyone. I am Rajit TJ, assistant professor, uh, Department of Civil Engineering, VVC Mysuru. Will be the master of ceremony for session two one three. Uh, firstly, I extend warm welcome to all the speakers and participants for day three session two program. So, dear participant friends, we have with us one of the most famous personality of India in the area of disaster management, Dr. Chandan Ghosh, uh, professor at NADM New Delhi. It's a great honor to have you with us today. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Okay. I also welcome today's panelist, uh, Dr. S.K. Prasad, Head of Civil Engineering Department, and Dr. Umesh P.K., Professor and Chairman of Research Studio. You. Welcome all the professors. Now let's get Thank inspired you. a brief biodata of our today's speaker, Dr. Chandan Ghosh. For this, I request our final year student, Ms. Nandushri Yen, to introduce professor to the gathering. Over to Nandushri. Thank you, Rajit sir. Good morning, Bob. I have a pleasant duty to perform that to, to introduce Dr. Chandan Ghosh to all of you. Dr. Chandan Ghosh is a civil engineering graduate from 1985 batch of Bengal Engineering College, now IIEST. Masters in civil engineering in 1987 from Jadavpur University, PhD from IIT Kanpur in 1992 and Doctor of Engineering in 2004 from Ibaraki University, Japan. He has been serving National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India since July 2006 as Professor of Resilient Infrastructure Division. He served Faculty of Civil Engineering at IIT BHU 1992-2000 did postdoctoral research in Japan and was on deputation to IIT Jammu from September 2019 to December 2020, where he has served as a professor and dean of student welfare. Pro professor Ghosh works in the areas of earthquake geotechnology, reinforced earth, seismic microzonation, ground improvement techniques, geosynthetic and bioengineering measures for sustainable development. He has devoted more than 30 years of his career in UG and PG training. Research guidance, development of teaching tools and training models for engineers, architects and town planners. He has published more than 135 papers in reputed journals conference proceedings, has recognition to his Misenal contribution, Professor Ghosh received Leonard Prize for the best doctoral thesis in 1993. CIDC Vishwakarma Award 2013, IGS Sri HC Verma Golden Jubilee Award 2013, Lifetime Achievements Award in 2019. Indian Geotechnical Society, Delhi chapters, among many. It is indeed an honor to introduce to all of audience. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. you. Thank okay, you. Nandu. Okay, nice, uh, Nandasri, for giving yes, uh, introduction. Of course, it is always good to listen to you all. Of course, listening about the self uh, is not always taken in a uh, uh, of course, it is the same thing, but main thing is uh, that uh, I would like to share, especially on a subject matter. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, we have on, some announcements. Uh, which uh, Excuse does me, sir. not probably include uh, share screen. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is on a subject matter. None of these things are being taught. So in our regular civil engineering masters uh, or even our uh, curricula. So I'll take up something uh, that which are not taught, but which has to find out some, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, weightage in going through that how to live with flood, especially urban flood, because we are mostly whom we are talking in your city, we are living in cities. Uh, so I will not go into the statistics, but I will go directly to some of the wonderful applications which are being recognized, uh, but not being discussed, uh, not being aware of 
uh, by many of the cities or 700 plus census cities are there in our country and so many projects are going on but none of these things have been taken up yet in the mainstream as a matter of you know living with the flood means here living with the flood means flood is extra and we also face the contrast maybe after a month or two or in the month of uh, april may we face the drought severe most drought uh, let us not go into how many years we have not faced the severe most drought let us not go into those statistics after how many years after 70 years climate change has broken this record or that record that is not going to bring anything what we we in our discipline uh, when the material is available since 1980s this kind of geomembrane geosynthetic geo geo drain ge uh, uh, so all these products is available only thing is that uh, how to use them so this is the third wonder material uh, in civil engineering or in our construction or in the mankind that people have ever created based on the industry that uh, means crude, crude petroleum industry whether it's in this form to hold back water on the wide land or on the river bed where river is a national property where we do not have to buy a land or purchase anything holding them in this manner or holding them in the city area or even in the hilltop where water crisis is always there throughout throughout the year when there is an excessive rainfall more than when there is a rainfall more than 700 millimeter in our average rainfall in the country is 1000 millimeter and we know that we have got the maximum rainfall even 14 meter 14 meter where is 700 where is 14 meter so when we are having such kind of rainfall area so then it is our own awareness skill that have to take us to make a balance between that excessive rainfall to rain uh, rare rainfall area and how to distribute it or how to store it how to send it and we all know all this how to only thing is that we have to know but on the other hand uh, the kind of uh, like life saving society of india uh, with this kind of things because i am talking about the urban flood living with the urban flood now filling this with water is a matter of few minutes you see these are all ready made material available for that no foreign technology or know how is that there are several foreign companies who are selling these things to our uh, organizations that who are special in the response area but these are the raw material that which are product plenty of them being manufactured by our petroleum crude petroleum processing industries and we are selling more than 90 95 percent of this material raw material exporting and we are hardly using them for the rightful saving uh, of the life and although it is a life-saving society but we will see and go through that what wonders uh, this can play in making a equanimity between having excess rainfall and not having much rainfall and then who is uh, and, and how we can play our own part of responsibility to bring this differences or urban flood which is a created one which we have created which is a new word coming into the dictionary for the last two decades so let us see that how we should handle uh, so before going to the main topic i would like to say that our current thrust i I'm um, using here thirst, not thrust, uh, because we want to take a sip of whatever we want, uh, good drinks and colorful, and when it comes in a packed bottle and something like that. So uh, our uh, thirst for knowledge and know-how and excelling, Indians are known worldwide now. And so uh, just recently I visited one of the conference uh, rather, uh, it is just after COVID, where uh, AI and digital uh, digital uh, learning uh, powered unified video compute, uh, computing platform, uh, uh, and so making world a safer, smarter. So, uh, 
uh, whether it is uh, uh, AI enabled uh, video analytics or even our videos, which is being recorded now, like word search we can do, sentence searching we are doing, plagiarism also we are checking, millions and billions of data or text is there. Now video search, video uh, at say 10 minutes, 30th second, who is the person talking over there? So that kind of search engine also has come. So these are enormous search and thirst and knowledge that we are we are gathering and we are uh, you know becoming uh, really smart enough in many uh, making many of these things fructified in our lifetime. Intelligent traffic management system, all these things are there, but. When we see something like this in Delhi recently, just two weeks back, our airport, of course, there are many airports get inundated like this. This is not the thing, but mind the word, 46 years of records broken in Delhi in September. And in those uh, two or three days, even many of us, we could not come to the office. So these are the file photograph and you can see millions of such photographs in the internet. So, but, but we would like to see that prepare for the worst. Prepare for the worst doesn't show anything here in our loftiest airport. And but prepare for the worst uh, because having a flooded home is no fun. So uh, you can see that. So whatever knowledge, know-how, technology, materials, ways. Uh, and, and response teams that are there trying to minimize the loss and life uh, uh, that all these things, let us not make it as a fun just for the sake of doing it and showing some scoring some points. So what is urban living? So according to OECD, Organization for <clears throat> uh, Economic uh, and uh, Economic and development, economic and uh, what is it, community development, something. Uh, so cities concentrate resources, and but preventing, adapting, uh, and recovering from shocks and stresses. That is where that we have to see. And in our city that we are living, weaving together thousands of economic, social, and institutional and environmental threats that powerfully affect individual and societal well-being. And across this uh, organization for economic cooperation and, uh, and development country, uh, it is in France, uh, the metropolitan area cover only 4% of the land, but account for roughly half of the population. And what is projected that in another 20, 30 years, it will be more than 50%. So uh, depicting dangers by the walls of civilized living standards. Uh, we are habitual enough to see what a, what a, what a things that happening around or in our own courtyard or in the road or in the special junctions. So, uh, and we are also habitual to see, at least for a few hours or few days, to live in such manner. And we are also habitual to, to pass the life in this manner also. It is just a recent photograph taken from Delhi, you know, near uh, that uh, our uh, that Redford area, that only thing that let us not look at this water. Let us look at that for 400 years old Greek structure, massive structure, if water is here, what kind of deterioration that it is causing to the foundation because of the inundation. So it is, again, uh, that uh, just looking at water is there, maybe it will be taken out, but what are the injury that they are causing, which will be life-threatening for this heritage structure? That is where, you know, we have to look at. Now, our metro cities get water supply from distant places. Most of our metro city, including Bangalore, Chennai. Chennai is very near to the coast, but it gets water more than 500 kilometers through a canal. And where from canal created from the dam that we made so much. But these days, dam construction have become uh, <clears throat> 
a, a, a game or a, um, there are so many objections are there because of their environmental uh, problems that they are creating and it is not unknown huge tons of literature studies surveys are being done for and against but we for us in civil engineer making a dam since time immemorial for the last 100 years we have more than 5800 dams in the country dam defined here more than 15 meter high and above they are called dams so we have more than 5800 dams in the country but not frequently that we are making the frequent dam making was done more than 50 years back several dams we have made in the uh, area to supply water and many other benefits and we know that cost benefit of making dam is really really uh, attractive and that is why about a decade back several ppp mode or private agencies were motivated to make dam with bot built operate transfer mechanism and uh, but now whenever like in sikkim there are several dams uh, uh, hydroelectric power dams are con construction but because of the sikkim earthquake in 2011 which has shaken and broken and made a lot of impact uh, to the bridges as well as dam which were under construction so private agencies uh, for them you know uh, whatever investment they have made it was a great threat for survival and many of them still under controversy and have not yet started so alternative of that in this area that which i have shown in the first figure itself instead of storing this much of water making a dam we can just make uh, such, such kind of things at various pockets and we have known the quality of this membrane and various laboratory tests and for civil engineers as i said it is a third wonder material after cement and steel then we had say that uh, uh, we have various gates and quality of this so we can categorically make a micro water storage management. I will come to this later, a little later. So resilience, in fact, is the capacity uh, of a city or community to prepare for, respond to, and adapt from dangerous and disruptive events. So uh, in fact, uh, resilience uh, is a multidimensional phenomena local authorities should design and implement authorities uh, strategies for urban resilience uh, so uh, and institute uh, economic social and environment. so there are a lot of definition given by oecd organization for economic cooperations and development they have given so let me come to first uh, this is the scenario of my campus about seven years uh, back seven ten years back uh, where the resilience that we have made because our campus used to be flooded once or twice for a few hours in a year especially in the month of july so uh, and because campus was uh, we are in a rented place there so uh, it is about seven acre and this place was lower than the surrounding area and there are drainage system is there but for one two hour it is used to be drained so what is the immediate way is that dedicate one such uh, uh, say uh, say pump uh, for two three hours or four hours there and then just drain it out to the other side of the road or boundary wall so that is a kind of preparedness that we can see or the preparedness that we can see here you can see this photograph in german area the, the Oder River is stolen from tributaries in neighboring Poland, where heavy floods have caused at least 15 deaths. So what engineers, they did, they put a temporary such kind of barrier, which gives a confidence to the, to the, to the authorities to, to go on, pass on with the confidence and understanding that nothing is going to happen to them. So we have been doing a lot of such valorous work in our engineering domain. Uh, but with urban flood, we have yet to make uh, such kind of things which are quick and reliable. And when river is swollen in neighboring country, Poland and water started coming up, then what kind of immediate makeshift arrangement we have to make so that 
this kind of road or these things become functional. So that is where that we have to see. So context is urban flood is happening and all around our dictionary as well as papers and everything getting piled up. And we are doing a lot of analysis, taking a lot of format and survey and pie chart, bird chart, many things are there. But management and attitude issues are many. Damage and laws are colossal and flood protection measures using natural way. This is what I'm going to highlight right now. Storage of surplus water not yet attended to rationally, but it is affordable. This is where that my presentation will be. Uh, and then flood walls for protections and flexible storage system using geosynthetics will be taking us or our role further into minimizing the damage and loss during uh, flood or especially urban flood or riverine flood. There are many statistics are there. Those who are new to this subject area, you see that every year such kind of data is coming up. But what is striking to note that from 1970 to currently 2019, and, and you see the height of this bar or column decorated with this color where flood is the most important one, this blue color here, which is, you know, it is in an upward trend. So does this indicate an index of development to the real sense? If with the year that we are moving and moving towards this direction, and, and if this one is an increasing trend, it, it flood is, is, is the main reason, and extreme weather, it may be drought, or it may be uh, cyclone, or it may be anything. So when extreme weather kind of events are happening, which is more than 50%, 60% in our days. We may uh, attribute it to the climate change as happening, but why climate change is happening, we have hundreds of models to, 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 uh, to represent that, which, uh, which are the aspects and hundreds of parameters are fed into the computer, algorithms are there and try to verify that climate change is the main reason, but what is that causing the climate change for that uh, huge computer uh, space is being taken and we are in that uh, game of uh, generating lot of data but uh, and restricting many things now switching over from uh, conventional energy to renewable energy uh, that and many things that we are picking up and also when this database which you can see in em dot you can see create crunch these are uh, this data is very nicely depicted only just to highlight two decades uh, before this millennium and two decades of the millennium now you see that the area of this is uh, with the number wise it is being depicted whether it is flood you see that it is uh, about the three times that it has increased. So total disaster events, it is only even loss and many such segre uh, many plus such classified data are decorated in the publication, whether it is hazard wise, human loss wise or money wise and where, wherever region wise, all these databases are being taken and depicted. So urban flood, the key question is, of course, impact of urban flooding is economical communication, health aspect also is also important, environmental aspect is also important. So it is not only civil engineer that they will play the role, it is the entire gamut of our knowledge and know-how experts, they have to come together to work in this area. And so root cause, of course, uh, oh, sorry, uh, root cause are all written over here. Uh, you can see uh, okay so rainfall in urban areas uh, let us see that uh, this is a quite uh, good road just I want to show it as a comparison we make underpass also uh, just to make that three level of communication uh, underpass this level and over that overpass is also there. Here, metro is under construction. Many of these underpass uh, this time got inundated like this. It means that it is our failure to maintain whatever is the water, uh, you know, pumping system that which was there as per design, as per paper, it was there. It became non functional. 
during this emergency period. So what kind of role that we have to play uh, in all these things uh, that uh, where transportation system, road, rail, or whether uh, who was maintaining that, they have to come, or infrastructure services, whoever is providing, they have to come in together. Or otherwise, we happen to see such kind of things you see uh, that uh, it is about to enter inside here. Or even in uh, Sandarban area recently, cyclone years on May 26 this year itself, that the kind of measures that we have taken over here by making this embankment and see the huge area that which is, these are all salt water came by uh, due to the three meter surge, storm surge due to the cyclone years. So if three meter, which is hardly 10 feet, which is only one floor, if that kind of wave can enter 50 kilometer, 60 kilometer inland, then what kind of river training work or what kind of hydrological work that in civil engineering we have been doing with our so many line departments that how come it is that three meter storm surge can inundate uh, 50 kilometer inland uh, with salt water uh, that is probably uh, not probably that is definitely our fault to allow this water three meter storm surge water entering into the hinterland for 50 60 kilometer and the kind of embankment that we have made over here these are completely misfit where we have to go for such things i will show later on also this photograph i often show that it is not this kind of uh, we call or non-technical people they say that hard measures rather we say the green measures soft measures which can stabilize such kind of things with a little more higher than this little more height then they can make a lifetime stabilization of the wall or slope over here using say the grass that which is a vertical grass and most of the time we use such kind of uh, measures also which are very very costly and sometimes they are no doubt reliable but this much of cost we cannot afford whereas these are being affordable naturally available that is why nature based solution nature has given us to make or save our these areas from such kind of damage where engineering so called engineering measures is taken which is a complete failure. So we can convert it to this kind of measures. And well, we cannot afford to have such kind of luxury of taking or adopting such kind of measures. So this is that you see that what a large area got inundated because three meter storm surge came over. So in that case, then if that is the case, if, if salt water enters from the sea due to a cyclone or storm surge, then if it kills uh, our uh, this uh, area that cultivated area then you can think of that the, the loss of damage or loss and livelihood and everything in this area just because it it has risen by three meter or even you see that amount of money that we are spending one brick complete brick laying over here cost to cost if you take one brick is about nine to ten rupees why to go for that when such kind of measure doesn't cost anything. It is naturally made. So uh, no engineering is required. And so the thing is that what we have not yet thought over this, like storm surge has over, come over here, it has entered somewhere here. So it is only few meters, maybe 10 meter, 20 meter of this, just only this kind of dam or embankment or levy that we have to make over here so that if we make one here one here one here then water is not going to enter in this area this is as simple as that unfortunately these are still not being adopted or whatever little adoption they have done they have not stabilized that is why they have broken it and that becomes an issue uh, that uh, it is an engineering failure rather rather than uh, the uh, storm that failed us so these are some of the things uh, that somewhere something that we can be taken so some of the sustainable drainage or permeable pavement in city area even if it is a heavy costly but we can recharge our aquifer 
in this manner. This is just the photograph taken from my campus, new campus where I am sitting. That these are the, uh, just this morning when I came, then I took this one. That we have this system, but not well maintained. But at the system is there. But at the same time, here drainage is also there. But so we have, even though here it is very nicely made it that it should have some kind of porous system inside. Here it is not taken uh, that way. It is just only because these blocks are available, plants are available, not taking care of the below that for easy. And when shade is there, no, no water is entering here because this is the solar panel. So sometimes we make certain measures uh, that we just to for just to like the beauty or architecture, oh, it is okay. But if we cover this one, then this is not functional. Then we are keeping again this kind of drainage system uh, also in place. So there are, it becomes redundant and or this becomes ineffective rather. What is to be taken is that create a spongy city. Like this is one uh, Dihua Li, uh, it is taken from literature, uh, that how our city or our rooftop, instead of making a rooftop gardening, uh, they can take this much of load. So they can infiltrate whatever water is there, we can get water through these for rainwater harvesting and we can make spongy city. This is because this is going to clean the water. Also in a city, mobile flood wall, like in Austria, see that one meter or 1.2 meter flood wall in this manner, when they are constructed and made, how much expenditure that is involved in making this wall and, and how much saving that it is, damage or loss that it is saving. So such kind of uh, uh, you know practice as well as uh, decision making with with you know, foresight into that, if we spend this much and take care of this portion, then it is saving at least 100 times worth property damage uh, during this kind of sudden flood in our uh, city area or even in an area that where river and flood, flood occurs. Or in a little more uh, closer view that how much res resilient they are, reliable they are, see that they are almost full to the brim, but having or given us that, what to, for that all kinds of calculation, safety, because these are the man-made structure and the materials are available, which given a satisfying solution to the urban flood problem with a, with a assurity that they are not entering here. So it needs a constant monitoring as well as design and proper site specific application like this, like this. So there are many such measures taken elsewhere, even in the country, probably they are not being documented or even saving this kind of facility here while flood water is there using such kind of tubes or material, which I'll show a little uh, later, or even taking care of such kind of measures uh, where we know the advantage as well as disadvantage, mobility of these things, dismantling of them. These are all, you see, in two, it is a file photo taken from the net, mobile flood, uh, flood protection wall, uh, and it is in Hungary that how they have made it. This can be dismantled during non, uh, uh, say, monsoon season, or this can be placed over here. So it is just a uh, plug and play something kind of things and uh, that, such kind of things are also being taken. And you see that what kind of assurance given, this is of course a stock file photo, just I'm showing over here, living with the urban flood. So living with the urban flood here, that what kind of assurance that it has given to these people by making such kind of world, which can be raised and with keeping all this allowance for increasing the height and so that as long as if water is entering. So for that, we have to have proper arrangement of water level rise and warning system and also many of the monitoring system. So in such kind of cases, uh, we need, there are several kinds of barrier system which are available in the literature. And how much is there for civil engineer? It is not unknown. How much load that it is going to come 
how much height that we can make, what is the angle, everything is available. One thing that which is taken very much that sometimes something, how many of us in our society take the responsibility of any such breakage of such kind of wall, suppose this wall that is broken somewhere here, what we do, it gets a media attention, police, case, files, then we defame the kind of uh, the people that who are involved. But sometimes what happens not in this living area, sometimes in an area like this, uh, like this somewhere, like these are the canal on which they have made flood barrier or flood wall like this. This side is the canal. This side is a canal. So to increase the capacity of the canal by using such kind of wall or such kind of wall, somewhere, someplace in, the, in this uh, country, USA, it was broken. So what they did, please. So, and it was, of course, when a long canal is there with wall is there, wall is broken. You see, there will be always some kind of, you know, progressive failure or progressive damage are there. Something may go uh, out of order actually when, because these are the very precarious condition over there. Every time you have to be alert, if something goes wrong, immediately some measures have to be taken or in place. In case something, something goes wrong, even after such kind of surveillance or in a remote area, you see that in one of the examples that taken that they are, uh, and they didn't know what the reason behind that, how it had happened and inviting for all those photographs, video, and witness and, and then survey, they want to know that and saying that we are sorry for these things happens. And then taking care of taking public into our, uh, you know, uh, consideration, then take the repair work, like uh, Professor Prashad was showing that within a year or within six days or five days of time after things happen uh, in Japan, how they have come back to the original position or better position in Japan the earthquake in 2011. So some of these things, of course, I have shown. And so recent flood, of course, uh, I'm, there are lots of lists are there. I'm go going a little faster. But only I wanted to show you since 1954 onward, 56 onward, you see policy statement. You will see the series of all these committees. Just only I'm showing you that don't go through this but only that I wanted to show 1954 onward or even before 2000, we used to know that disaster management is drought or flood, too extreme. But after uh, this 2000, in the last two decades, so many things that have been added, there are more than 30 such uh, disaster that which has hazards rather being added into our disaster management act that which came up in 2005. But the policy statement, supplementary statement, high level committee, high, high level committee, ministerial committee, and Rastiya Bar IO, then Pritham Singh committee, national water policy, report of the committee on flood management in the northeastern states, report of the committee on this, 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 this. So many things have occurred. You said just I wanted only to decorate my slides to tell you that so many committees are there. Then what is there on the ground? That is what we have to be saying. And what is, who will do that? It is not only civil engineers, as I showed in the beginning, it is all together in the society, wherever we are living, we are, uh, we are to take care of our surroundings, that reasoning with that, taking appropriate measures, solutions that available elsewhere, and then making it customized to the local requirement or even in the regional requirement. So there are many examples are there. National water policy, and then again, Rastia, recommendation Rastia Bar IO, and report of the technical group of technical ward, you see technical ward is same as what uh, we are from the technical background. So uh, flood and erosion problems in North Bengal, and then task force on flood management, erosion control, see more than one and a half decade, these are all being followed. So anyway, uh, 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 flood versus drought, uh, because 85% of the rainwater goes to sea to meet with the salt water, then it is useless, it is a waste. 
and current storage capacity of India's almost 6,000 plus dam uh, is about 350 uh, billion cubic meter. And so uh, there are certain ways that some of the countries are taking forward. Hong Kong or Beijing, China, uh, Australia, they have taken care of coastal reservoir uh, that where now they are thinking that to, to store this water when they are meeting the sea, then before they meet with the salt water, use geomembrane or make some kind of barrier in the coastal area itself so that we can store this rainwater, not mixing with the salt water, so that we can use it. And you know that we can make pipeline system even a kilometer, even a hundred, when we are making 58 kilometer of, 58, 60 kilometer of uh, highways in a day as a target. Uh, and so similarly, we can make more than 500 kilometers in a day or two by pipeline carrying this water from the sea to the wherever we want, like from South Karnataka to North Karnataka it is hardly 300 kilometers. So 300 kilometers of one meter, two meter, three meter diameter pipeline using geomembrane these days uh, that, that can be laid in less than three days or four days of time. And we have the capacity uh, uh, of, and we have the material also. So it is only that action is to be taken from the uh, rear surplus area in the south of Karnataka to uh, uh, to drought prone area where farmers are dying. So if we just keep this kind of event just as a uh, as a sake uh, for the sake of just keeping a record, so many people are dying, so much damage is there, and you have seen so many images are there uh, previous decade to current decades. Uh, how bar chart, pie chart are showing an upward trend, which is not an index of the development, but solution is in our hand. We can carry water surplus area of southern Karnataka to the northern part uh, in less than few days of time uh, by pumping system. We have huge uh, pump system where already in Andhra Pradesh uh, such system has been uh, made. So, or even whichever city, whether it is Chennai or Mumbai or whatever cities are there, Vizag or Calcutta, where here you see we can we can have a gated system of controlling inland water, which is sweet water, not mixing with the tidal water or salt water, having a some kind of gated control, which doesn't cost anything compared to the losses that we are making or the kind of crisis that every time that we are making and stopping many of the things or even promoting rainwater harvesting to each and every plot doesn't require all those micro planning only when the water everything is coming to the sea after rainfall is there and just having a control over here can give us a lot of leverage to meet uh, uh, urban flood as well as uh, meeting with the water crisis drinking water crisis so anyway uh, something like these that in our city area or in a gated colony would like to say that this is the entry gate or this may be the out gate when gated colonies are there we know very well that how uh, it is all having a boundary wall i don't have to take examples from foreign country but we can quickly make such kind of barrier wall so that for few days or few hours of time, whatever flood water has come, we can stop them not entering into the compound because if they enter, then the kind of damage and damp proof that course work that we have to do, lifetime damage would, would be there. There may be 20 companies in the country that who takes care of damp proofing and other thing, all will be just only nothing compared to that preventing water as a fast measure, preventing water from entering, rather than taking measures after they have entered. So preparedness becomes very important. And what is that important that has to be done in a manner being taken care here with a cost maybe not even uh, even few thousand maybe for each of the flat owners in a gated colonies in the cities. Like these are the things, again, an example from outside the country these are the some kind of flood wall with gates and control that which will be closed when there is no flood, which will be open up uh, or closed. Uh, control is their uh, entry. Or even in our underground, 
where we can have this kind of, you know, this is again taken from uh, uh, sources in the internet that this rubber gasket over here is enough here in the basement to close it when flood water is about to enter so that it makes a silly sealing of this thing. Again, such kind of things are not unknown to us. So even such kind of gates are also there. So it is just uh, that we can take micro measures in saving our, uh, say, fire system or fire high pump system, red colored, means these are there in the basement area. So even or, or even in the ground floor. So we can save them with the gate that which doesn't cost much. It is only that application of our uh, common sense to save these things. So even such kind of things are also there. Such kind of things can be made beforehand before water comes here because we know these days uh, that how long that uh, uh, water is going to come, what level of water is going to come. These days we are able to make it known, but of course in the country we have not. See, uh, one person only, it is not 10 percent is required. When proper mechanization is there, just one person is just raising this one by himself. So we have to do this kind of micro planning and preparedness at our uh, own level. So uh, anyway, uh, I would like to say that how geotubes or geosynthetics are being used here uh, in protections of our, uh, as a uh, flood uh, erosion protections or everything. And uh, many companies are working on this uh, in the country itself. But we it is not getting proper uh, monitoring and proper you know application. Uh, based on the site, uh, based on the site condition, because these are the things of study have not entered into our research lab or into the minds of the students and community and the applicants or the municipality who face the problem. It is somehow vendor driven or some kind of uh, uh, some kind of gameplay goes on so that the, the, the you see reliability of such things, cannot be denied, but making it practicable on site needs uh, lots of compassion as well as community spirit uh, from the organization that working or the problem area being taken care. It is not that only money that uh, works. So we can increase by such kind of wall also. These are again example from abroad. Or we can also save the functionality of this one by making a wall or boundary wall like this with waterproof course, whatever it is available. We don't have to change anything over here to, to prevent this water entering. Even if some leakage is occurring or some control leakage is occurring, we can always put up one horsepower or two horsepower pump here itself in the compound here itself if some leakage is happening so that throw them out. So such kind of measures can be taken or even it is not that our city that uh, we are facing this trouble. You can see, you know that where it is lying, what kind of problem that they are facing because they are not prepared up. Now they have become prepared. Or what kind of measures that uh, we can divert the water using such kind of floatable items with uh, sand, like diverting flood water with a sandless sand bag. Huh? It, is a, it is developed in 1989 this just polyurethane or something absorbent uh, that uh, patented in eight, 1989 and contains a super absorbent powder that activates when wet, growing to full size in minutes. Once activated, the inner gel acts together. So it is called sandless bag, but commercial name is flood sucks. And this is all year of establishment 1989. And just I have taken from some uh, India Mart, which is available, an India Mart member since January 2006. But I don't know how many of us, or city living people, or household people, have been aware of such kind of material which they can put up. I'll show some more. Moreover, now in Japan or advanced country, you see how they do not take or they do not change anything of salt water into into the uh, soft water. They just simply take care of these things. And so, so making such kind of system for us pavement, you know, it is, though it is costly, but storing that precious 
rain water in this sophisticated manner uh, is no doubt costly but such things are being adopted by many of the uh, organizations in the country taking technology from there and then storing these and of course uh, uh, we still have to go far away far away or storing water in a hilly area with this kind of hold all kind of things and then regulate this use this or making a pond like this and then using geomembrane in this manner or even storing water in this manner or using such kind of bags polythene bags uh, protection barriers or even like this that fixing these things no water is coming in this side or this way also or in this manner see or, or even such kind of floating things uh, or even making communication alive while putting this kind of geotube or aqua dams filled up with water and leaving it because it is a two lane or three lane uh, uh, road but maintaining that road functional is one of the very very uh, important way to keep this communication functional how much does it cost and everything we can calculate it within no time now advantage of flexi membrane for storing water which is quick and simple mobile and foldable excellent for logistics means all these things are available in several sizes and volume it can be 10 lakh liter generally our elevated water tanks in our city which cost more than 5 crore to construct and which is the most vulnerable due to earthquake still we make such kind of elevated water tank up to a height of maybe say 50 feet or 60 feet or say 30 meter and we store hardly 2.5 lakh liter whereas this kind of flexi membrane things underground we can make even 10 lakh liter 20 lakh liter also so and so they can be designed for 25 years and 10 years warranty people are giving 100 percent recyclable how they are carried to the site as i was mentioning on the riverbed which is a national property how they can be carried say 25 liter storage geomembrane foldable things it can be carried in this manner only to the site wherever we want to store water so uh, like uh, uh, urban flood risk of course many things have been shown and only thing is that uh, there are certain kind of things which you can go through some of the statistics taken in our country's contest or uh, how it is go uh, going on in different countries or cities what are the measures that they have taken and then rainfall runoff how much it happens all this calculation can be taken and there are many softwares are available Hackress or uh, many such 2D, 1D, all these things are there. Flood simulation is also there. Uh, then facts and enforcement. Uh, so like this is a Kedarnath area where they have made a big concrete wall right now. This is that Mandir that in 2013, 16, 17 June that this uh, slide has occurred. Uh, of course, uh, such kind of flexible dam or libby or some kind of bond is more helpful than making a concrete retaining wall. Then as far as diversion of the river water or river linking, it, it is into controversy. But we have got now new thing because in 2000, uh, uh, river linking project, national river linking project from surplus area to drought area, from here, Brahmaputra is surplus, so it can be brought over here, or even Godavari area to this uh, Kaveri area or Krishna area, where some part, of course, Palavaram Dam was under construction, it is now not proceeding much. Um, so, from Godavari's water surplus area to Krishna is a huge uh, project was taken, uh, but canal is made, pipeline also made, but dam is not complete. So some of the things that were the water, we have many wetlands and other things. So we can stop enter water, uh, mixing of water or control them. And also we can have such kind of control also. There are a lot of things are there, even coastal reservoir in South Korea 
or uh, what I wanted to say that uh, even saltwater barrier is also there in our Kerala. Uh, like here, this lake, uh, this one is some barrier is there. Uh, this is that. Or even this one, of course, in uh, Galpar Kambat, uh, which was about 2,000 square kilometer area, which they wanted to convert uh, to sweet water by making a 29 kilometer uh, dam plus uh, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, with two, three, four rivers are there, but uh, it is a huge 64,000 crore cost, uh, but it is still in the doldrum, but still work is going on some part so uh, this is like coastal reservoirs uh, in hong kong uh, that you see this is a portion that uh, because they do not have much place so they are storing that uh, sweet water here itself in this manner and of course these are the grand liver, uh, li uh, river linking project which are not going going to take place but with the pipeline constructions and connecting through a pipeline and pump system, we do not have to disturb the environment. So Krishna, uh, which I was talking about, this is that uh, thing they have done from Patisima to this uh, Krishna River here. So they have made pipeline also, canal also, uh, but uh, it is uh, still not under operation because Polavaram Dam is not going on. These are the kind of pipeline that which are being made or available which civil engineers they can do okay so i would uh, like to end over here uh, because uh, there are certain kind of how to live with the coastal flood even these are all design manuals are given what are the things to be taken into account and what are the design these are all available in in the manual form so okay and finally, I want to show that some of the application of the flood sucks, uh, which you can see over here. And, and even you see that water, no water is here, but those bags that they have been sandless bags, you say, or even in our bathrooms or in our shopping mall where water is entering, quickly we can stop entering water. Even diversion of the water directly falling over here, it may create more trouble over here. So just little diversion is also or even in the bathroom, you see that how it can be used. There. So there are embankment levees are there. And uh, so these are naturally, these are being made. This is of course in Japan, but in our country also we have. But unfortunately, we don't maintain like uh, many of the times. And even that what I said, that canal is here. So canal, we can increase the capacity, water capacity of the canal by making such kind of things or these things that I have shown over there. Okay. Like we make, uh, like it is in Karai Canal, we make such kind of wall. This is the sea. Huh? So this is not the way uh, that we have to look after. We have to see such kind of... Uh, there are, of course, uh, the last slide is the role of different actors in nature-based solution. So uh, it is national and sub-national government, infrastructure regulator, uh, not that only civil engineer, international norms and standards to be looked into, and then investors who are going to, of course, it is required. Then, what are, uh, and sub national government, and because it is by OECD, uh, have taken it from their disaster risk management strategies, NGOs, and pro, private actors, landowners, all together. So, civil engineer is uh, one part of that. But we have to give those ideas of structural and design and everything. So finally, uh, I would say that uh, what is written in Rig Veda in English, uh, that about the water management, that come together, speak in concord, let your minds comprehend alike, let our efforts be united, let our hearts be in agreement, let our minds be united so that we all live in peace. Thank you. So this is that the photograph I shown before, but how much is that Mandega worker uh, that has been involved over here to bring uh, such kind of things to this one, which doesn't cost much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, thank, uh, thank, thank you, you, sir. Uh, uh, that was a really an informative and inspiration session.
and you enlightened us on how to control urban floods and mainly how to tackle them and what are the techniques materials and methods to be adapted to prevent and mainly to minimize the losses due to unpredictable urban floods thank you for that sir okay uh, dear participants uh, just a reminder kindly post your questions in the chat box and give your valuable feedback what we have provided in the youtube chat box so i now request for the q and a session dr sk prasad dr umesh pk and dr chandan gosse over to the professors yeah thank you thank you professor rajit and uh, thank you professor chandan as usual you are lucid and uh, urban flood is a serious problem uh, literally you know uh, all over the country and uh, we have not really geared up to the situation the kind of uh, you know uh, concrete jungles we build and uh, not allowing any infiltration and uh, whether it is you know uh, bangalore chennai new delhi everywhere uh, there is scope for uh, improvement as, as you rightly mentioned we need not think about you know solid constructions for uh, controlling flood simple means definitely is very effective and useful and uh, so you know very quickly there are uh, uh, you know uh, i request you to answer two questions you have mm -hmm. already answered in your uh, lectures uh, yeah one question by ravi raj says what is the alternative for dams ha huh, yeah, yeah yeah of course there is no one answer there are many alternative of dam of course when it is a, we are making a dam of large like theri dam 260 meter so we as a civil civil engineer alternative here when we are able to make 260 meter 62 meter high dam and getting the advantage of that and within 7 to 10 years when we are getting all the investment being returned as per calculation so uh, from that economic aspect that whatever we are getting tangible returns that we are getting uh, from the dam so we must uh, go for dam wherever it is feasible uh, but at the same time alternative means where especially in the hilly area or even in the plain area and the micro irrigation or storage system which is being shown over here where local people demand can be reached and we do not face any crisis so uh, in that case uh, geosynthetic geomembrane flexible storage system uh, especially when more than 10 uh, 85% of the water rain water going to the sea so our effort would be to store them on the river bed or even in the coastal area using flexible membrane or some kind of earth structure so in that way whatever we are storing in the dam which causing a lot of uh, climate allergic and other environmental issues and many things at least we can store them uh, on the river bed or even in the sea like i have shown one example in the case of uh, hong kong so in that case alternative could be uh, many now coming out in fact professor sitaram and uh, he is the chairman of international uh, society for coastal reservoir uh, system uh, from india and uh, so he has been promoting this technique that alternative to dam to store water on the river bed or even in the coastal area or even in the delta area especially the sweet water to mediate this issue thank you thank you very much okay and uh, also there is one more question let me just uh, look for that and in the meantime professor uh, umesh yeah, you yeah, want yeah. to say something yes, sir i think uh, our uh, dr chandan ghosh has uh, explained very nicely it's a very informative session on flood management and he has covered almost all thing it is a, i think i can say this is a new uh, information we have not heard so far such a, a wonderful lecture by chandan ghosh i think it is very useful for our participants and our students thank you very much sir yeah thank you sir and uh, we are uh, already having professor murthy who we are very eagerly waiting oh, to okay. oh, good, uh, good morning good morning sir very nice good morning thing that we can do <laughs> you know uh, uh, welcome welcome <laughs> you know the special uh, thing about him is you know he has his birthday on teacher's day okay and he is a, he's a great teacher 
So, <laughs> sir, we are honored and uh, happy Teachers Day. Uh, thank uh, you, thank you. Day. Yeah, yeah. And happy birthday to you. Okay, okay. Thank okay. you, thank you so okay. much, and happy yeah, Teachers Day to all of you. Professor Chandan, one uh, one quick answer. Okay, yep. this is from uh, Mr. Rajesh Agarwal. Mm -hmm. When we take advantage of geosynthetics in making high-rise structures, in instead of using you know fiber rebars. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, instead of using steel rebars, steel bars. So, huh. can you use fiber rebars instead of steel rebars? Uh, Professor Sivya Murthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, it yeah. is being used for retrofitting as a uh, retrofitting, but there is, yeah. uh, uh, it is, uh, of course, now um, these days, in fact, dampers are being developed uh, like steel and uh, rubber. Huh? Steel and rubber. So, they are fiber reinforced plastics are being used like in IIT, Gohati. So there are some way geosynthetics are being used uh, as a replacement uh, uh, because it is a fiber reinforced plastics are being used there. But on the other hand, retrofitting and other things also where uh, FRP uh, are being used. Uh, yeah. But uh, making or uh, uh, making a, another uh, metallurgical, uh, you know, fit into the country when we are facing no we are going into five nanometer thin uh, or controlling the molecule in the semiconductor and something so it will be a maybe a fifth revolution or third or fourth fifth revolution in the industry four or five that if we are able to mix with the molecules of like uh, alloy and other things with plastics but uh, that they may come later on but professor uh, murthy <laughs> answered this thing I know. And then, you know, these days, uh, bamboo reinforcement is becoming very popular also. May not be in tall yeah. structures. So, uh, we should be able to find some solutions in future. So, but, let us anyway close this lecture because uh, we definitely would like to listen to Professor Murthy. So, I think, you know, uh, we'll close this and uh, hand over to the session chair for, uh, you know, uh, the next lecture uh, so, thank you all for professors uh, for their uh, for that interaction q session now i request manoj p a professor department of civil engineering to propose out of things over to manoj uh, thank you rajit sir good afternoon everyone uh, we have come to the end of uh, the seventh lecture of online training program on fundamentals of disaster management so it is my privilege to propose the out of thanks for this session on behalf of the Department of Civil Engineering, Vidyavadaka College of Engineering, Mysuru, and National Institute of Disaster Management, uh, Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, Government of India, New Delhi, I convey my sincere thanks uh, to this session speaker, Dr. Chandan Gosar from NADM, for sharing his valuable insights and experiences in uh, flood mitigation measures. Thank you very much, sir. I thank uh, Dr. Sivyar Muthi, Professor, IIT Madras, for gracing this occasion. Thank you, sir. Yeah. My sincere thanks to Dr. Umesh PK, sir, uh, Professor and Chairman, Research Studio, VVC Mysuru. Thank you, sir. I wholeheartedly thank our uh, beloved HOD, Dr. SK Prasad, sir, for his continuous support and motivation in organizing such events. Thank you very much, sir. I also thank the panel members present here, organizing committee members of NADM and uh, VVCE, Mysuru. Further, I wish to thank all the participants for your active participation in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Manoj. Uh, now I request yes. all the participants to join us for our next session on Introduction to Earthquake Disaster Management by Dr. Sivir Murthy, Professor of IITM Chennai, by using the same link. It will commence after a minute. Thank you all. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's once again uh, uh, homecoming for me to come back to uh, Mysuru and uh, be with uh, my good friend, uh, Professor Prasad, and talk about uh, yet another subject, which is uh, uh, bottom line, uh, hot topic of the country, 
which we need to address immediately. Thank you. Uh, introduction to earthquake yeah. disaster management. Yes. Uh, <laughs> sir, I believe, you know, uh, just a brief introduction about you. Uh, yes, they sir. will have. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Very quickly. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, dear participant friends, we have with us uh, one of the most famous personality of India in the area of earthquake engineering, Dr. Sibir Murthy, sir, professor at uh, IIT Madras. It's a great honor to have you with us on this occasion, sir. A RT welcome to you, sir, for this session. I, I once again welcome all the panelists, uh, Dr. S.K. Prasad, Dr. Chandan Ghosh, and Dr. Omesh Apikas, sir, for this session. Uh, now, I request uh, our student, Sushma B, uh, to introduce our session resource person, Dr. Shivar Murthy, sir. Over to Sushma. Yes, thank you, Rajit, sir. Good morning, all. I have a pleasant duty to perform, that is, to introduce Dr. CBR Murthy to all of you. He doesn't need any introduction, and I also have started in many of his achievements. Dr. CBR Murthy is a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, Chennai. He earned his Bachelor of Technology in Civil Engineering in the year 1984 from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Master of Technology in Civil Engineering in the year 1986, also from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. The Doctor of Philosophy in the year 1992 from California in, in Institute of Technology, Pasadena, California, USA. His area of interest are nonlinear behavior of structures, displayed, displacement based earthquake resistant design of buildings and bridges, seismic design codes. He has over 85 publications in Scopus Industrial Journals and many international journal publications. He is currently the chairman of Earthquake Engineering Sectional Committee CED 39, Bureau of Indian Standards, Government of India 2020. Dr. C. V. Murthy has received many awards, some of which are 2018 ICI Best Paper Award, 2016 ACC Nagadi Award, 2016 ICI Best Paper Award, Best Teacher Award, Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad in 2009, Distinguished Teacher Award, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in 2008. It's my privilege to introduce you to the audience. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sushma. Uh, uh, thank you, Sushma. Uh, sir, uh, just an uh, announcement, sir. Uh, dear past participants, I remind you to kindly uh, post your queries in our chat box, uh, in the YouTube chat box. Our panelists will going to take up those questions after the presentation. So kindly feed, uh, fill up the feedback links and along with the quiz question, it will be posted in the chat box. And the participants will going to get the certificates, those who registered in the NADM portal on submission of all feedbacks. So now without further delay, I now request Professor Sivan Murthy, sir, to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you once again. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back to Vidya Vardhaka College of Engineering, Mysuru, and uh, talk about a subject that is uh, absolutely center space for the nation, and that is uh, earthquake disaster mitigation. Uh, and uh, that is in particular and uh, earthquake disaster management in general. Uh, I'll spend uh, today's uh, time uh, of about an hour on disaster management to begin with, and then earthquake disaster mitigation and earthquake disaster mitigation in India. So I'll try to narrow down uh, to what we need to do from what is the subject. Before I move forward, must mention here that earthquake disaster management is going to be uh, controlled critically by the contributions of three entities. Uh, one is academia, second is industry, and third is government. And when I say industry, the community uh, is also part of it. When I say government, community is part of it. And when I say academia, community is part of it. So it's the people's game that we're talking about when it comes to disaster management. Let's get started and look at the first item of uh, disaster management. First off, a few words I need to sort out before we go forward. Uh, hazard is a word that we use regularly. It is the threat of danger but the event has not occurred yet. Uh, that is uh, what is hazard. For example, we have electricity in uh, the power socket. There's, it's a hazard, but uh, if you put your finger in, that is when the trouble begins. So when you look at earthquake uh, hazard, uh, you're looking at the fault system that exists in the Indian map. 
and uh, you are looking at the seismic zones that reflect uh, the entire activity of fault systems uh, that is likely or projected to happen in time ahead. Second one is exposure. It is the presence of the people are likely to be affected by the negative fallout of hazard. So this is uh, referring directly to the built environment. Uh, we are discussing uh, disaster management because of the built environment coming into the picture. If built environment were not there and we were living on trees and the natural environment, disaster management would not be such an issue for us. Uh, when it comes to exposure, it's the people that we are uh, looking at all the time. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you are a businessman, you look at your business activity. If you are a professional manager, you'll say, uh, I will need to do some transactions and so on. The third and the most crucial element in disaster management is uh, vulnerability. And vulnerability is uh, being unprepared to resist the negative effects of hazards. And again, this is referring to uh, the built environment. So the three together actually will cause trouble for us. But before we understand that issue, I want to separate the words hazard and disaster. Hazard, as I said, was threat or existence of danger and the event has not occurred. And disaster is negative consequence of the hazard and the event has occurred. So if you put your finger inside the electrical socket, then it's a disaster. But if you don't do that, and if you're watching that electrical socket, you know that there is a hazard there. Uh, that is the pre-event scenario. And risk is a cumulative uh, projection of all of these three together. And uh, largely, this is estimated before the event. There's no point in uh, discussing uh, risk after the event because the event has occurred. But before the next event occurs, you have to talk about risk. In many occasions, you notice that risk is talked in terms of probability of occurrence and uh, probability of uh, likelihood of exceedance and so on. So you will need to have some background in uh, statistics before uh, you can really quantitatively do risk yourself. Uh, risk components are very clear now, hazard, vulnerability and exposure. And uh, what we are looking at is uh, risk can be estimated from many points of view. But largely, my discussion today will be on the subject of the built environment only. And uh, the intersection of all of these three together will be the focus for us. Uh, when you look at risk, uh, this is one way of defining that these are the three quantities. But some people also would like to bring in uh, preparedness and response uh, into the discussion. But I would think that uh, if we are able to understand vulnerability, understand exposure hazard, these are the consequential actions that we have to take uh, as a way forward. So let me explain a little bit about risk here. There are three independent uh, inputs, which is uh, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. So I have a situation here, which is uh, high hazard and high exposure and low vulnerability. Then I have another situation here, which is uh, high hazard, uh, high vulnerability and low exposure. Uh, think of a situation where uh, in the Kutch district of India, the largest district of India, we have large number of houses built by the NRIs and they don't live there. Those buildings are empty. So hazard is high. Uh, vulnerability because those technologies uh, adopted in the construction are based on uh, normal constructions and they are also not verified by any organization uh, uh, statutory body for their safety. So that would be a condition where a low exposure, people are living abroad, they are, those houses and buildings are empty. In the previous occasion, we are talking about high hazard and high exposure and low vulnerability is very well built structures uh, designed as per standards and so on. In this case, you will get a lower risk. And the third case, of course, is where we have uh, very low hazard, but uh, very um, high vulnerability and high exposure. Uh, this is a case where uh, in peninsular India, uh, we have uh, structures built with very poor uh, strategies. And when there's a surprise earthquake, we get into the trouble. But in the normal case, you are not able to estimate the surprise earthquake. You will think that you are safe. Uh, normally, that's not the case of individual, only two factors governing. Normally, all the three factors come into picture. And uh, here is where we are living in today's environment in the country where we have accentuated all the three items, exposure, 
every day the uh, floor space index or far is increasing and uh, vulnerability is increasing because there is no municipality out of 6000 municipalities in the country which is verifying safety of the structures which are going to be built and the hazard of course multiple hazards are there and uh, the <clears throat> education is not necessarily reflecting uh, the needs of today's india and uh, the standards are not adequately understood by students uh, in their undergraduate program and hence we are actually working in a very very aggressive environment as far as the built environment is concerned our hope is that in time ahead we can reduce many of these factors and make life a little more uh, easy and we can breathe well in this environment so what are the elements that are at risk when you look at uh, the community we are looking at housing and this is our biggest worry 95% of the people die in houses uh, across the world and even in uh, the constructions in india in the past earthquakes in india we have noticed this so single story one to three stories uh, these are the candidate cases where we are seeing huge losses of lives and that is because most of these structures are self built and do not have the necessary standards for resisting the effects of uh, earthquakes second is the infrastructure that we have public buildings health facilities uh, communication transportation water sewage electrical power gas and petroleum systems and then fire services and commercial centers these are the ones that are infrastructure of a society and uh, these uh, the standards uh, we don't have separate standards for design of their of these structures uh, except uh, for industrial structures we have a separate standard but for the others we don't seem to distinguish adequately except for the importance factor thus uh, there is a need for a higher rigor which is to be brought in into the design procedures and also in construction technologies uh, essential services needed after the disasters are clear uh, we need food we need public utilities all of them and uh, the schools must be in place so that children can return back to to their uh, study as soon as uh, the normal sees restored heritage and history will be another part that we will uh, lose and we have been losing every time uh, there is an earthquake we lose a significant part of our heritage and history we need to be very careful that some of the prominent structures we need to uh, make sure that we do a, a urgent retrofit of those facilities so what is the mission the mission is that we have six uh, verticals or six pillars of disaster management and those are prevention mitigation preparedness response rehabilitation and reconstruction uh, prevention is to literally to prevent the disaster from happening uh, there are occasions like the cyclone example where you have a forewarning uh, for a couple of days and you are able to evacuate people from low lying areas or vulnerable areas and you are able to save a lot of lives and india has successfully managed to do that in the last decade particularly after our negative experiences in the late 1990s but that's not the case in the case of an earthquake uh, the next one is mitigation mitigation is uh, uh, building the built environment to be capable of resisting the hazards expected hazards preparedness is preparing people to be ready to face uh, the uh, uh, scenarios of the uh, threats being realized in uh, time ahead and response is what is it that we will do as a collective set should there be a disaster how do we behave how do we conduct ourselves what are the activities to be undertaken and uh, response largely has rescue and relief and there is the recovery phase which is rehabilitation and reconstruction rehabilitation is about people you have to bring back their mental state back to uh, strength so that they have self confidence to do, be able to conduct their activities the affected people and then reconstruction is should they lose any of their houses or any facilities uh, common civic facilities can we redo those and rebuild those structures for them so on the whole when you look at uh, this entire activity uh, reconstruction and mitigation are built environment related rehabilitation and preparedness are people related and response is uh, a mixture of all of these together and uh, prevention is again a matter of uh, technology largely being used and giving the advantage to the people 
when you look at earthquake disaster management per se uh, one item which is not possible for us to uh, do is prevent earthquakes uh, from occurring and that is why uh, i will uh, discuss only five elements uh, in the future subject but i will also show you what is prevention before i discard it uh, as a mainstream discussion in uh, disaster management related to earthquakes another point i want to make here is disaster management effort uh, a 1 rupee spent before an earthquake is uh, worth uh, 20 times uh, after an earthquake uh, 20 rupees after an earthquake that's what they say and uh, this depends on the economy of the country this depends on the current practices of the country if we continue this way without any techno legal regime in the country then one rupee spent before the earthquake will be 100 rupees after the earthquake uh, or even more we will lose more and more assets as we go forward but my worry is not so much about the assets my worry is about the people we can rebuild the assets we can get reinsurance and then get money to redo our constructions but what about the people who we lose that is where i think we need to not look at numbers per se but talk about life safety to begin with and once life safety is assured then we will talk about economy issues um, this is the story in the plains but if you go to the hills this is three times more difficult to do disaster management in the hills so it is better for us to do it right the first time not just uh, in the plains uh, but also in the hills both of the locations both of the locations we have to be extremely cautious in trying to do the best the first time around uh, the disasters that we have uh, come under uh, four levels and level zero is uh, it's a local activity managed uh, with by people themselves and uh, the uh, level one is actually the state level activity and level two is a national level uh, disaster and level three is where we need international support and uh, we are looking at uh, where each of these uh, systems are going forward what is it that we need to do so high uh, level of uh, disasters is something that uh, we have noticed in the tsunami in the tsunami 2004 tsunami where international systems themselves have failed uh, to provide support to the other nations because every nation was grappling with this problem themselves so it can happen that there could be such uh, events where the whole world is actually taken uh, on a grip here uh, I'm looking at uh, the district magistrate's uh, house and office uh, in Bhuj town and uh, we we know that the district magistrate is the uh, decision maker of every district, is the prime decision maker of every district and uh, if the institutional systems fail, if the disaster, manage, uh, disaster manager of the district, uh, the district magistrate is himself or herself incapacitated, then how do we really handle disaster management? And that is where levels of disasters are important for us. We say a non-disaster situation is uh, zero and minor and localized incidents is uh, level one. And uh, level two is disasters handled at the state level. And level three is going beyond the capacity of the state and going to the national level governments and seeking help from the neighboring states and so on. So as I mentioned, out of these six uh, uh, pillars of disaster management, uh, especially for India, we are looking at in disaster and uh, earthquake disaster management, uh, we are looking at two items, especially being the prime focus. And if we don't do these two items, we will keep doing more of response as a compulsion. And the day we are successful in uh, mitigation and preparedness, that day you will notice that we will have to do much lesser work in response and rehabilitation reconstruction. And uh, very clearly, out of the two items beforehand, uh, earthquake safety problem is a built environment problem. If the built environment is secured, uh, even people's preparedness uh, effort will also change significantly and have newer dimensions. So my appeal will be that uh, the nation should understand that mitigation is the way forward for ensuring safety of the people of India first, and then the businesses and the uh, governance continuities and all of those to be guaranteed. So today, when you look at all of it together, our urgent needs will be mitigation for saving people's life and mitigation for ensuring governance continuity 
and business continue. But if you are looking at uh, uh, the holistic uh, uh, system to come into place, we have to get started urgently. And that is where I would say out of the six items today, number two, mitigation and number three, preparedness will be uh, the center space for us. And number four will continue to happen. Uh, four, five, and six will continue to happen if we don't start any work on number two and three. Uh, once again, uh, please note that prevention is something that I will uh, try to show that it is not possible for us. Uh, earthquake disaster management uh, has mitigation, preparedness, response, rehabilitation, reconstruction. First, we need to have uh, safe constructions. We need to do technical education and prepare disaster management plans. We need to have damage assessment, active emergency operation centers, do mock drills and search and rescue. We need to have temporary shelters understood, designed, kept ready so that we can implement them as soon as required. We need to have the community engagement in all the disaster management related activities, especially after earthquakes. It's very severe. Trauma counseling on the medical front is important for those who are affected and livelihood restoration will form the center space for rehabilitating people to their regular activity. Coming to reconstruction, permanent shelters have to be built, uh, owner driven uh, constructions or construct contractor driven constructions. This is what we have to decide whether we have to do it in situ or to relocate and how much is the loss compensation we will give and uh, can we uh, restore the entire built environment. When you look at this entire agenda, it is going to come in three parts where we are looking at the three players to take their respective uh, sides. When I uh, show this division, it is not that the academia is not required in items on response, rehabilitation, reconstruction or government is not required in the remaining four. It is just that somebody has to take a primary lead role. And that is what I'm looking at uh, when you see uh, this uh, uh, whole subject of uh, earthquake disaster management. And we are making a competent India only if we are able to share our responsibility and commit to do the responsibilities uh, to the fullest. So this is the overview of uh, the earthquake disaster management. But as I said, I will talk about prevention and show you that prevention in involves a lot of instrument instrumenting the country's uh, uh, earth surface and it involves the networking of all the sensors and preparing an early warning system. We need to online, uh, monitor this online all the time and watch if there is any uh, signs or signatures coming. We need to have a decision support system because the database is very large. We need to do forecasting based on available data that is coming through. We need to extract hazard parameters. Should there be any threat or danger for us? and inputs to management actions, uh, mitigation actions that will have to be taken out of these uh, uh, signatures that are coming as you monitor this earthquake shaking across the country. We need to assess the risk of the built environment and we need to do predictions. What will happen should there be an event and so on. Uh, awareness campaigns, emergency operation centers, scenario projections, what will the community do? Should there be uh, a big disaster and so many people are going to be affected? What will be the loss assessment uh, for everything, industry, academia, education, and so on? And finally, will you evacuate? What it seems like is that once again here, while we have our roles and responsibilities, the bottom line is if you look at the diagonal elements, these are the ones that will tell you that evacuation is not possible in an uh, earthquake because the earthquake comes in uh, a few seconds. And prediction of earthquakes has not been successful so far. Forecasting also has not been successful. There's a lot of effort being spent on early warning system. And uh, this is uh, something that I thought I should mention here. Early warning with 30, 40 seconds warning will not really help the communities, but some automated systems can be worked on with that. But you need a robust early warning system for that. And I hope that the early warning systems being proposed or being used have that robustness, otherwise even that will become a wasteful effort. And instrumenting the whole nation's uh, surface, land surface, is an act activity that is uh, uh, just about begun. It will take some more time before that instrumentation will come into place. On the whole, disaster, earthquake disaster prevention seems to be a far cry at this point of time. But if you come to mitigation, 
all of these activities that are there. Uh, understanding typologies of structures, manuals of good practice, technical education, uh, regulating unsafe typologies, new technologies to be brought in, full scale testing be done before technologies are proposed, skilled artisans, continuing education, retrofitting safety standards, changing uh, bylaws, licensing engineers, and peer review of the designs being submitted to municipalities, risk indexing so that uh, we are able to tell people where is the risk higher, where is it lower. And finally, priority to structural safety through an act. All of these uh, are going to be the center space for us. But the bottom line is that we have not got started on any of these. That is where the worry is. I must mention here that uh, uh, if uh, we continue like this, our risk will keep increasing. The new uh, built environment that we are adding every day, uh, we are supposed to increase the urban and built environment by 2.3 times of what exists today and uh, to ensure the 70-30 uh, ratio of rural to urban India is flipping to become 30 rural and 70 urban, 2.3 times we will increase and uh, it will become an embarrassment for all of us if we don't have at least the basics in place. To uh, go on the diagonal, Structural Safety Act, safety standards, full scale testing, technical education and typologies understanding typologies. Of all of these, I will pitch technical education uh, to get started immediately. No college in India teaches the subject as a compulsory part of the education uh, in uh, the undergraduate program. That's very embarrassing. Some individual institutes and colleges are crusading, but it's still not yet in a situation where we can say we have large number of graduates who will all know earthquake safety. Preparedness, as I said, is about people and uh, we have a whole spectrum of activities for the people and if i go on to the diagonal you will notice that uh, on the diagonal the uh, elements are the sdma and ddma state disaster management authorities and the district disaster management authorities have to come in we have to do a large number of mock drills to train people to understand what is it that we need to do after an earthquake emergency operation centers must be operational today as we speak mass media communication material has to be developed and televisions newspaper and all the um, social media has to go uh, on an aggressive front to share this uh, information and we need to communicate risk wherever that risk is uh, coming to response again a spectrum of activities are there for response also uh, most important of these is the diagonal again golden hour uh, you have to use to save people's lives at the hospitals, you have to do triage, make sure the right uh, patient, uh, the right doctor is looking at the patient who is affected. Temporary shelters are provided at the earliest and the civil supplies are made available. Search and rescue happens in that uh, golden hour and emergency operation centers are actually effective in directing support for the affected areas. When you look at rehabilitation, we are talking of uh, once again a spectrum of activities. Uh, we need to uh, look at uh, people to be brought back to their activity. Uh, economic activity of people has to be brought back. Medical health and support uh, has to be brought in uh, very, very uh, urgently there. Physical health standards have to be specified and that has to be provided in the um, conditions of living that we are giving them. And then ex gratia, it's a mental uh, you know, confidence that uh, Government is caring for us, so ex gratia is being provided. And so that uh, amount has to be also be made rational. And then social activities have to begin so that children will start going to school. Women will get into their regular activities and men also will do uh, you know, community level activities. All of it basically bringing back life to normalcy. And then reconstruction, finally, a uh, lot of uh, technology activity this involves permanent shelters in situ or a new site location, again, negotiating with the people, owner driven or contractor driven compensation for the house to be built and the safe designs. This is where civil engineering uh, will come in in a big way to fix many of these items in this. So with that backdrop of uh, what elements are there in uh, disaster mitigation or uh, disaster management per se, I will now narrow down to earthquake disaster mitigation, the word as mitigation. We look at the built environment, we have uh, uh, a compulsive uh, need
to ensure safety in the entire built environment. And this is where I would say once again that uh, while economy seems to be sitting on the driving seat today, I would say time has come to shift uh, safety to the driving seat. And that is where we have to be non-compromising. So what is the key? There are uh, three sets of elements that are getting affected during a uh, earthquake. One is that uh, people get affected. And second is that there is property that is getting affected. And then third is that we are not able to provide protection uh, to a large number of our communities. But if you fix the uh, people, uh, if you fix the property, then uh, all the others will get taken care of. And the wisdom says that if you look at internationally, we have had a number of experiences and uh, we don't want to repeat those mistakes, which we are today in terms of manpower, land use, material, technology and compliance. We are not having any compliance mechanism. We are grafting new technology without verifying them. We are using new materials without the standards approving them and the land use is going indiscriminately and the manpower is not competent to do development of the built environment. With so many items gazing at our face, I think nation has to wake up urgently and then fix these problems immediately. So what is the way out for us? The way out is that from where we stand to where we need to go, there are two possible paths. One path is that we take the shortcut and put a ladder. And the second path is go through the dangerous route of uh, walking through the waters for a certain time. But after that, you will see great relief. The first one is to do large work suddenly. And the second one is to do small work all the time. Right? Uh, it's tempting to do the large work suddenly because uh, it's got a lot of visibility. But the small work uh, done all the time is the one that will give you final success. And uh, the first approach is actually response rehabilitation reconstruction. And the second approach is actually mitigation and preparedness. So mitigation will still be the only watchword for all educational institutes. We have to prepare people to be able to do the designs and constructions safely the first time around. I talked about disaster mitigation. I showed you this entire spectrum of activities. And now uh, I don't want to spend more time. I have spoken about this before uh, in the previous lecture also. And so I would say that when you look at this entire activity, a couple of items that really come back to my eyes is that uh, we need to do full scale testing in the country. We need to add uh, safety standards. Uh, uh, you know, that is what we've gotten started on to revise the safety standards of the country. It will take some more time. But as of now, uh, we are not seeing a competent India to be able to face uh, earthquake disasters uh, or to reduce earthquake disasters and make uh, India uh, reduce its loss of life. Uh, one of the items that I see uh, is the use of structural walls, which has uh, even though standard came in 1993, we are still using moment frames and moment frames are not going to save anybody's lives in any earthquake prone area. That is uh, loud and clear from all the earthquakes worldwide and we are continuing to repeat that mistake. <clears throat> and I hope that designers will wake up and uh, start um, doing this uh, at the earliest. Also, I pray that the teachers learn that first and then encourage all the students to consider uh, using safer systems when they get into the practice. Uh, full scale testing, I'm uh, particularly concerned that when technologies are sold by the market without verification, stating that it has come from that country or this country, and many of those countries do not have earthquakes, it is embarrassing. And uh, many a time, the due information is not available with the decision maker and hence some mistakes are being made and it can be very expensive should a earthquake come in and that uh, those uh, so-called modern technologies are brought down to the ground. And so we are looking at full scale testing here, three story full scale structures to be tested and only then uh, we need to take it forward, especially precast constructions uh, because their game is entirely in the joints 
and if the joints are not snug then the structures are not safe and there are no calculations possible for ensuring that these joints are acceptable uh, that is the reason why we are saying that there is a compulsory need for doing a full scale testing of uh, such precast technologies uh, so today we look at our uh, built environment and we don't know exactly where we are actually and code compliance is a whole spectrum of code compliance is happening in the country it's, it's to be corrected and corrected urgently we want to definitely have safe structures and uh, we we want to undo or, or remove the unsafety completely uh, in in all forms in whatever measures that they are being practiced today but uh, the excitement of uh, decision makers to keep increasing fsi values is something that i would say uh, is not something that you should really uh, permit to happen because of the lack of techno legal regime in the country lack of education in the country uh, as far as earthquake safety is concerned and we need to make sure that uh, we stay with uh, uh, you know uh, structures that we can design and construct properly rather than get into the high end where we don't have uh, even fire fighting system should there be a simple fire forget about an earthquake and so uh, there is a need to introspect deeply by every uh, municipal corporation before they start uh, you know permitting these uh, uh, exodus of uh, constructions of uh, different nature for which we don't have competence necessarily in the country so the existing structures we need a lot of work to be done for that the new structures we need uh, you know uh, the basic understanding to be in place and then for all this we need competent engineers that's where our worry is that do we have the required people uh, that 4% of engineers are going to control the rest of these uh, activity of the remaining people so first we need those 4% in place uh, and we can start uh, doing work parallelly but we don't have master trainers because that 4% is not in place and that is where the trouble begins for this activity i talked about this before licensing of engineers is essential for us especially teachers and structural designers and uh, we are hoping that today with no constructions uh, going into um, audit i'm hoping that we'll get started with 5% this year and eventually in 10 years time we will do 30% uh, 100% of our structures to get into audit mode uh, third party peer review is an important subject everybody should understand the difference between quality control and quality assurance and uh, any uh, building owner will uh, want to first uh, have a set of people who can do do, do the design of their uh, structures and uh, the person the owner has to pick them based on their competence that is the first responsibility of the owner second responsibility of the owner is that he has to find another parallel set of people who will oversee the work of these people and that is the quality assurance group both of them have to be competent quality control has to do the work and quality assurance group has to verify that work and this is an independent activity the verification and the feedback has to go to the building owner and not to the quality control group alone and this means that uh, we need this urgently in place so that uh when we do so much of retrofit retrofit is even more challenging task than the construction of new structures there are three errors that we can do when we do work and those three errors are errors of concept execution and intention and this is where i see that if techno legal regime comes into place we can remove error of intention if licensing of engineers comes into place we can uh, remove errors of execution and if capacity development happens in all the colleges then we can remove error of concept and this is absolutely uh, the center of all our discussion that where are the people where are the people where are the people we must begin people are not there but what to do we'll make an imperfect start we will begin with what we can and apply 80% of the knowledge that's available internationally 15% we will modify that marginally for india's needs and 5% we will need to do new uh, knowledge generation or research on that front to make it happen for india at least this 80% progress we can make and that is what i am seeking as the start uh, everybody wants to do 100% but 80% is good enough to get started now 
because we need to know how to work together with each other and how to build all the systems in place. So let's start with this 80%. That is what is my prayer uh, today. The men and material all have to be there. The third point uh, I wanted to share today was earthquake disaster mitigation in India per se. Uh, we know the story of India. So earthquakes will not stop in India. And uh, the earthquake hazard maps of India have been continually being upgraded and we are in the process of upgrading it once more in 2021 and uh, i am hoping that uh, we will be able to bring a more realistic estimate of hazard in the days to come even with the existing map we are looking at uh, uh, 57 percent of landmass and 78 percent of india's population is sitting in seismic zone three four and five which is a hundred crore people are sitting in a moderate to severe seismicity and no college teaches this subject is an embarrassment. And no municipality verifies safety of the built environment is an embarrassment. And uh, I'm uh, hoping that we will change and reverse this trend at the earliest. Otherwise, the, uh, the unsafety or the risk will only keep accumulating because of the newer constructions that we are adding without any uh, regulated development. So what are the documents that are there for um, controlling uh, or guiding the entire process of earthquake disaster management in India? The first is the Disaster Management Act that came in 2005, 16 years ago, right? Second is the National Policy on Disaster Management that came in 2009. And uh, the intent of this policy is to build a safe and disaster resilient India, and it gives you uh, directions as to uh, holistic, proactive, and multi-disaster oriented technology driven um, approach for uh, uh, doing the disaster management. Very nice. Then in 2019, the National Disaster Management Plan had came into picture. It says we need to make India disaster resilient across all sectors and decreasing significantly the loss of life and improving the livelihoods and assets in different forms and so on. Uh, the, uh, the National Disaster Management Guidelines for Management of Earthquakes came in 2007 and it says zero tolerance to avoidable deaths due to earthquakes. Uh, while the first three documents are talking in general about disaster management, now these documents are specific to earthquakes alone and earthquake management alone. So this is 2007. Uh, where uh, it says that we have to do mitigation and preparedness before and we will have to do response after. That is the focus, uh, additional uh, thrust that has been given there. And develop a national community that is informed, resilient and prepared to face damaging earthquakes in future with minimal loss of life. That was the charge that we have from the 2007 document. In 2010, <clears throat> NDMA released a guideline for banks to say that Loans and lending should be contingent on compliance of disaster resilience standards. That is September 2010. In 2014, NDMA came up with the guidelines for seismic retrofit of deficient buildings and structures. And it says reduction of loss of life is the focus here. And that is what we want to do by doing the retrofit of uh, structures. In 2016, it came up with the guidelines for hospital safety. All hospitals in, in India will be structurally and functionally safer from disasters such that risk of human life and infrastructure are minimized. This is what uh, has been the thrust of this document in 2016. There was another that came in 2016 and that is school safety uh, document. And it says all children and teachers and other stakeholders in the school community are safe from any kind of preventable risks due to natural hazards that may threaten their well-being during the pursuit of education. And this is uh, the bottom line of uh, what our priorities are. So we are saying we don't want to have any uh, negative fallout in any school in the country. And uh, looking at the past, number of schools have collapsed during the earthquakes. And so this is a very, very important document to uh, work with. In 2019, uh, NDMA came up with uh, a homeowner's guide for earthquake and cyclone safety and uh, this is to guide those who wish to construct a house or to buy a house or a flat in a multi-story building for both of them in 2019 again uh, the 
uh, NDNA came up with the Earthquake Disaster Risk Index report, and that was to forecast the relative risk within a city and across the cities based on hazard exposure and vulnerability. Uh, when you look at the national disaster management structure uh, at the government level, uh, there is NDMA at the center. It takes uh, inputs from state uh, disaster management authorities, district disaster management authorities, and communities, and develops macro policies and assists states in implementation. And then the state disaster management authorities take inputs from NDMA and uh, their constituent DDMAs and communities, develop micro policies based on the macro policies that's laid out by NDMA, and implements the macro policies of NDMA. Then, in turn, the SDMAs work with the district disaster management authorities, where they are local governments and community groups are brought together. They implement the micro policies of the SDMA and take inputs from NDMA and SDMA on the way disaster management has to be done. All this is peacetime activity. Come an earthquake, there is an emergency activity that the NDMA comes into picture and works with the affected SDMAs. They, in turn, work with their affected DDMAs. And this is the governmental system that has been laid out for our uh, work uh, during, uh, before and uh, during and after the earthquakes. But if you look at all stakeholders together uh, in the entire process of uh, disaster management in the country, we are looking at government of India, state government, local authority, NGO, industry and community as the stakeholder list and interfaced by the NDMA, SDMA and DDMA. Then we have subject specialists who are scientists, professionals, and managers who give guidance on the various subjects related to disaster management. They are related to macro policy, micro policy, implementation, or even monitoring. All of this is guided by the technical inputs provided by the specialists. So what are the actions? There's cooperation, there is partnership that state governments have to do with the center as well as the district man, disaster management authorities. At the district level, capacity building has to happen as well as they have to work with the community. So that's a very uh, significant uh, um, depth activity that we need where communities are being engaged in disaster management. And effectively, finally, we are hoping that we will get the sustainable disaster risk management as an output of all this uh, our output outcome and impact of all of these activities. Right. So the critical player, the first amongst equals, is actually the state disaster management authority. The more active the state disaster management authority is, then uh, you will see the results of that particular state becoming more obvious. Uh, for example, the Orissa state disaster management authority took the cyclone problem very seriously and they worked very hard for uh, two decades now and they have uh, made significant progress and that was possible because the state gave priority to the safety of its people. Let's look at funds that we have uh, in the subject of disaster management. Uh, National Disaster Risk Management Fund, that is what it is called. The 15th Finance Commission has uh, recommended that uh, we take that, uh, we constitute a fund called the National Disaster Risk Management Fund and give 80% to response and 20% to mitigation. So this is the first time mitigation is getting priority in the country. Eventually, I'm hoping that the numbers will swap. If we do a lot of mitigation and the losses of lives will come down, uh, mitigation money will go to 80% and response should go to 20%. But in the short run, this is correct because uh, we have a lot of unsafe built environment and so response will be a crisis for us. Response money again has response and relief, recovery and reconstruction, preparedness and capacity development as the share within that. Right. And for the years 21 to 26, the amount that has been laid out at the national fund is about 68,000 crores, right? And mitigation will get about 13 to 14,000 crores. And imagine this will be the money that will be used for central activities like building capacities uh, at the national level uh, so that these people will be able to provide support to all the states. So these will be technical people, this will be uh, subject specialists who are not necessarily professional subjects, but management related to disasters. Then there is the state disaster risk uh, management fund, which is also recommended and has a similar structure of expenditure. 
and the amount laid out or recommended for 21 to 26 years is uh, 1 lakh 60 thousand crores but of course when you divide this with 30 states uh, you will get uh, a smaller sum here but that is still 5000 crores or so average is a large sum of money for each state to consider uh, building their basic systems in place so if you believe that you're getting this sum to put in place systems and processes then we are doing very well I'll uh, try and conclude here by saying that resilience is something that we have to build in the communities. And if you don't do anything, um, there is uh, that's one way of life. But if you do only preparedness, that's also not bringing you above the zero line. And what will bring you above the zero line is actually mitigation and preparedness. In earthquake disaster management, this is loud and clear worldwide has been established that uh, mitigation and preparedness alone will be able to take us forward in the long run. And I'm hoping that uh, India will learn the word with mitigation soon and start working on that. And so you can see that the recovery time can be reduced significantly. While if you're doing preparedness, there's no recovery time. You'll never be able to recover out of la the losses that will happen because you don't have any strategy, no uh, particular approach to address the issue. But what is important is that uh, this was possible because of the mitigation efforts uh, made in the past. And uh, which means that if you are able to consciously keep improving the mitigation efforts, uh, this recovery time can significantly reduce in time ahead also. So what are the, we need to take some new directions or new thrusts in uh, disaster management in this country. And the first is that we have to shift uh, to a new level of thinking. And first is that you need to increase focus on state disaster management authorities and district disaster management authorities. Currently, everybody knows NDMA, but they start, they should know SDMAs and DDMAs also in the next five years. They should learn about SDMAs and DDAs, DDMAs. There has to be huge coordination between all of these people. There should be manpower appropriately identified and community participation brought in and prioritization and timelines to be made and uh, technology should be leveraged upon. Uh, obviously, they, no state can solve its problem all at one shot. So they should start a pilot district program, learn all of it in that state and the, in that district and implement it across the other districts. The six phases of disaster management cycle will become the focus, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, rehabilitation, reconstruction. Um, if it is earthquakes, then prevention will be dropped, but all the others will stay in place. And of course, you will identify stakeholders and start bringing the dialogue uh, between all of them. Risk analysis has to be done. We need to do risk analysis of the built environment and based on hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, and uh, bring those numbers out and tell the people where is the risk concentrated. So start prioritizing the areas and start using that as a basis. So technology has to be leveraged. A technology can be used in monitoring and forecasting and early warning systems for, let's say, cyclone and so on. Uh, mitigation activities, hazard resistant constructions, retrofit of constructions and uh, detailed R&D for additional new technologies and so on. Uh, full scale testing. Uh, we need to have preparedness. A scenario building has to be done. Show them what will happen, what is likely to happen. Should there be a very large uh, event? and undertake mock drills and exercises. Response uh, has to be uh, watched carefully. We need to build communication channels. Information technology should be leveraged upon. And uh, for rehabilitation, physical and mental health will become the focus items. Economic activities, small economic activities have to begin in every little distributed sense so that people will be able to come back and earn their bread themselves. And uh, reconstruction uh, type designs have to be um, kept ready so that reconstruction can happen quicker in different regions uh, of the country. But bottom line in technology will be deep R&D. And that is where uh, we are not investing enough in R&D. And we should do that so that the gains of all this deep R&D will be there for all the six verticals of disaster management. Disaster management systems and processes have to be in place. Administrative arrangements have to be there. Financial arrangements have to be there. Legal arrangements have to be there and operational arrangements have to be there. I'll focus on uh, legal arrangements. Techno-legal regime is required. You need to have a municipality which says, uh, submit all the designs and 
drawings and calculations and then have a group of people who are competent to check all those designs and drawings and calculations and then say these this needs to be improved please improve it and bring it back and in due course of time once the design is sufficiently in compliance with the national standards then they will provide the green signal for going ahead to construct and enforcing the uh, techno legal regime uh, requires some legal instruments and i pray that those legal instruments also will come into picture in time ahead uh, implementation is the key in all this what we are noticing is that disaster management activities will spread on to the uh, six verticals of dm fair enough but timelines and monitoring are the crucial items here but uh, for a country which is not yet got started uh, deeply into disaster management at the grassroots level i would think chain of command must be understood very carefully and the incident command system the best in the world is with us and we should be able to capitalize on that and uh, energize our emergency operation centers uh, urgently to get action going all the activities that we need to do have to be put in four baskets short term medium term long term and there are activities that you should never do and this is the first time you are hearing me say you should never do these because in disaster management these are not considered to be suitable uh, they are detrimental in nature and should never be funded ever and uh, we should start uh, stopping the losses today itself in those activities uh, we need to have the desirable activities prohibited activities are first set desirable is the second they are important and should be made a made fund should be made available to start those activities right away and essential are those which are urgent and uh, eventually they should be funded we, we may prioritize the long term activities uh, urgently but we should um, do those uh, medium term also and then there is this vital activity which uh, is to be done immediately and we need to fund it right away and this is the uh, timeline that we are talking about a short medium and long based on the immediate nature of the activity or the urgent nature or the important nature so immediate are the schools uh, governance continuities houses uh, public places those and essential are eventually all the infrastructure that we have to do and so on so it has to be kept on a, a little ramp and we have to scale it up monitoring the ongoing activities is also important mid term corrections are important people should be able to get guidance on this and that is how we should move forward uh, so it's time for us to have a disaster preparedness index where we will monitor our mitigation activities our management activities community readiness activities give points for each of the sub items and then accumulate that and see how each uh, district is doing how each state is doing how uh, the nation is doing as a collective set so uh, there are uh, not urgent and urgent activities and there are not important and important activities in disaster management the first set doesn't exist not important doesn't exist all are important and response and recovery are the urgent activities but as you know um, mitigation is not an urgent activity but it is the more uh, very very crucial activity that will control all the remaining so <coughs> many a time we have to give more priority to not urgent and important activities the urgent and important will get done anyway but not urgent and important are mitigation and preparedness and we have to give priority to those it's a gigantic task to do this and the major steps are the urgency is an issue for us uh, prioritization is an issue human resources uh, are something that we need to garner and monitoring the progress is crucial uh india is going to uh, surge forward in its developmental activities and the people uh, the number of population also will keep increasing and to support them we need to have these uh, basic disaster management systems and processes in place only then we will be able to guarantee safety the older model was that uh, you buy cheap products you can large number of people can use that but they'll have to buy them again and again that model is not the model that we are recommending we are saying we need quality disaster management activities so that more people can benefit over time and uh, they can be sustainable the poor quality activities are not sustainable and so we don't want to encourage any poor quality activity we would like to shift to the new 
model urgently, immediately, and right now. So if the government keeps on pushing uh, programs and people are not interested, this is not a workable model for us. What we require is that the people should be asking for earthquake safety and governments can work faster and help uh, all the people do their activity. Otherwise, disaster management will remain on paper. And today we should not use the word paper, remain on computers. It won't be effectively at a field level. So I would say it is urban uh, India is actually going to face a major crisis uh, if we do not do earthquake disaster mitigation urgently. And uh, it's a statutory warning, like on every cigarette box or every liquor bottle, it will be written. I will uh, say that uh, this is very, very essential to undertake education, research and development at uh, high priority. And we need to invest now and invest in mitigation and, uh, and we need to reduce response activity with better and better mitigation. And we need to start it now because all the documents, national instruments are in place for us. Only our desire to help ourselves has to increase. And uh, if we get started, there'll be many who will learn from us and they will benefit too. But I'm hoping that the brave ones will start walking forward. If our dream is to build a earthquake resilient India, then of course uh, we have to come out of untruth to truth, from darkness to light and from life to eternity. And this is what sustainability is the word that disaster management is asking. And so are our scriptures saying that it's possible for us to bring sustainability in our uh, way of life. I'll stop here by thanking uh, the Vidyavartaka College of Engineering, Mysuru, and in particular, Professor Prasad for inviting me to this meeting and Professor Kanmani for uh, uh, making sure I'm here at the meeting on time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, yes. Thank you, sir. And that was uh, indeed an informative session. Thank you for making us to understand about the role of different communities like academia, industry, and government in disaster management. And you also enlightened us on disaster management, earthquake disaster ma mitigation in India, and many more, which might have created true awareness in our young friends. We look forward to having many lectures with you in future also, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, dear participant, uh, it's a, just a reminder to uh, post your uh, queries in the chat box and also give your valuable feedback. The link is provided in the chat, YouTube chat box. Now I request Professor Chandan, uh, Dr. Chandan Ghos from NADM, Dr. S.K. Prasad and Dr. Romesh P.K. from UVC to handle Q&A session. Over to professors. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rajit. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Murthy. Uh, you know, you were simply fabulous like every time. I don't know uh, <laughs> the perfection with which, uh, uh, you know, uh, you uh, how you prepare and uh, uh, whether it is uh, dialogue delivery, whether it is uh, uh, the presentation or time management, uh, simply superb, lot of things to learn. Maybe I should ask you a question. Uh, you mentioned we need to you know prepare engineers we need to prepare people to be aware of uh, uh, you know disaster management how do we prepare teachers to at least you know uh, emulate some 20 percent of your quality yeah uh, see uh, i think the baseline information if that can be shared with our teachers uh, that has to happen in colleges and uh, what i notice is that a number of individuals are crusading across the country. Maybe if you invite them and then hear from them their stories of what they're doing in, let us say, Orissa Disaster Management Authority. Let us say, Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority. Let us say, Himachal Pradesh State Disaster Management. These are the people who have gone ahead of the rest of the pack in on different fronts. And uh, you need to invite such people and hear their stories, early, early stories. I'm not saying success stories because we are far away from success. But the early steps that they have taken gives us courage to really emulate them in time ahead. So that will be a starting point for the college, let me say. And uh, the teachers will benefit immensely by that. What is also important is there needs to be texts that can be learned, uh, learned from and uh, taught in the classes. So books on disaster management are very few. Formal books are very few. 
and I'm hoping that I'm going to request a couple of our retired uh, government officers who can spend some time now and uh, they can prepare this text. It is uh, likely that by another year or so, we will have a book in place. And uh, uh, we can share that. It will be a public book, of course, and uh, we should be having that resource available. But even as of now, if you look at that, I showed you the intent of showing you the national documents was there is already a rich repository of information there. And teachers should benefit from that. Go to the NDMA website, download the 33 guidelines that they have and many more other documents that they have uh, free downloads and read all of those books. They tell you immensely what is incident command system, right? What is medical preparedness and so on. And then chemical disasters uh, which are happening across the country. So there is enough information already in public domain with the governmental agencies that we can start work with. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Murthy. There is one question from uh, Professor Vijayendra of uh, BIT Bangalore. Uh, is NDRM considering famine also as man-made disaster uh, or uh, hazard along with earthquakes, floods and cyclones? Famine is on the list. Um, uh, it is uh, uh, being seen uh, carefully, but uh, formal documents are not yet ready because they are going to study that in detail and come up with some uh, guidance on that. But as of now, uh, it is on the list for discussion. Yes, it is on the list. Okay. And uh, uh, I don't know, interestingly, this time uh, I have not had many questions, maybe because you are so perfect. No, you know, no, the subject is such, it is new. Uh, <laughs> see, anything that you have been teaching or learning, they will have questions. But if you are hearing it the first time, you will have, uh, you know, hesitation to ask because uh, you may, may be stepping over the line. I can see that. Uh, very nice, sir. So, uh, I request uh, Professor Chandan Ghosh to make your comment. Yeah, no, no comments, especially the aspect that for the academia, which you have asked. Uh, Professor Murthy has uh, given the list of all the documents uh, that are available with NDMA, NDM or NIDM. Several training programs that are going on where BBC and NIDM, we are now in the second uh, session that going on. Uh, second three days, uh, like we have been uh, now uh, going for many of the training program just to aware them, aware the academia this time, especially during a, a pandemic. Uh, so uh, added to that, which I would like to say that many of the academia that they have been looking for writing projects on disaster management to DST or MOES or other things. But according to 15th Finance Commission's report, where Professor Murthy has shown in two important slides, even how much crores are being allocated from 2021 to 2026, which comes uh, on an average three, four thousand crore per state, per population and location. That is one vital information where uh, I would say that which is there in 15th Finance Commission report is also available. So our academia, uh, I think all these documents which are freely available, they should go through and state governments are really looking for expert uh, intervention to help them uh, initially that utilize that money because that money if they are not utilizing there will be a negative remark on that so while utilizing that they are then academia come forward and work hand in hand with the with the states that who are uh, who are uh, ready for uh, getting this uh, support from the academia and researcher in various forms like disaster insurance is one thing which we have not been able to take it forward as of now it has not started with anyone but that 20 percent mitigation fund the uh, mitigation uh, fund that is given so uh, some of the states now coming forward with the disaster insurance so uh, in that regard also uh, you know many of the things even uh, there are many foreign companies uh, that who are having their uh, uh, their organs here in india there are more than 21 company recently nidm did uh, one of the exercise that how many of them are there? There are 21. So they have been invited just to attract attention uh, to the disaster insurance. Uh, so state government, prime FSE, they are interested that to allocate some money because there was a controversy recently came up in the month of March when this pandemic was declared as a, 
as a disaster in the beginning and then there was a pil came up in the supreme court and then later on uh, the supreme court has given order take a uh, prima facie uh, uh, recogn recognition of that disaster so at least at the ratio payment has to be given to all those who died over the covid but now uh, there are certain thing is that when covid vaccines and other things are uh, given freely by the government now exgratia payment to 4 lakh rupee to all those who died due to the covid is a matter of uh, serious issue at, at both government level and court level but in not going in that side that whatever mitigation fund is available i think academia uh, researcher should take advantage of that taking some of the site specific study and giving a solution to the state government even district level also the money is being distributed through sdma uh, would be a very good opening line uh, rather than writing some kind of uh, uh, pro project proposal to conventionally to our uh, dst or other organization because Thank disaster you. management area related it is a quite open money is available uh, a grant uh, is already there so <laughs> yeah professor prasad uh, let, let me let me add here that yes, uh, uh, as i showed you the presence of academia is prime in disaster management and today most academics like if i'm doing bending moment shear forces it has nothing to do with disaster management let me not uh, go in that direction i would say the day you are already received in the rank of a professor from that that day onwards you have to work for the nation you have to, you, you just can't say that i'll just draw my salary and teach bending moments you have to work for the nation there is no choice because uh, if academia doesn't come in uh, the poor suggestions that are coming to the decision makers is actually creating more nuisance uh, than uh, you know informed decision academia do detailed study and provide considered information and give provide considered inputs to the government for improving the state of affairs you just can't have your hands washed off and stay quiet out of this at least after the rank of professor i think the time has come i would yeah. say up to the rank of professor you are on training and after training you have to return back to the nation <laughs> very yeah. well said sir very well said in fact you know i totally agree with you if all of us uh, you know uh, at the rank of professor think like that maybe as you rightly said we can change our country so Gee. i agree with you sir yeah. uh, okay uh, 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 sir you mentioned that you know uh, the uh, seismic zonation of the country is going to be revised and hopefully yes. 2021 yes. we will have the new zonation uh, which yes. is more rational do you think mm -hmm. it is going to be drastically changed or will it be somewhat similar to the last one you see see what what is happening is that um, this is the first time we are doing a quantitative seismic hazard assessment and it is based on probabilistic hazard assessment protected by the deterministic hazard assessment and uh, having said that the zone shapes will change a little bit uh, but more importantly the coefficients will go up a little bit but the method of design will not change so largely it's only a value of a number z value will change a little bit zone will change a little bit but uh, i would say it will be more rational than before earlier it was based on past earthquakes only now it will be based on future likelihood of events also happening and that is why this is more rational and uh, we are hoping that uh, in uh, this month's meeting uh, we should be able to make a, take a decision of doing a wide circulation of the information uh, before we finalize it we will do a wide circulation of the information okay okay thank you thank you very much sir uh, uh, we have another uh, uh, few minutes only uh, before we have a very informal uh, valediction actually uh, people from uh, nidm will be joining my principal also will be joining i request uh, for murti to be there and uh, mm -hmm. uh, i hope it will be for about 30 minutes so before we stop and hand over to mc i request uh, professor umesh sir to make uh, your comments sir yeah yeah uh, thank you very much uh, professor murti i think it's a very excellent lecture and uh, you have mentioned in academia you should include the earthquake engineering subject i think that is very important i think you have clearly told that is all throughout the 80% of our country is uh, seismic zone i think we, we have to insert uh, in, include in every 
subject test. Yes. And also, you also mentioned that other one, full scale testing. I think yes. before uh, whatever new methodology or new technology you develop, you do that full scale testing before coming to the actual thing. That also it is very nice. I think I think uh, we'll appreciate for your uh, effort on that one. I think uh, we have to help for us how to go about all the things and all. Uh, it is a nice lecture, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Murthy. I think. Uh, sure, sure, it is sir, sir. Extremely you. grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, if uh, yeah uh, everything is fine, then you know we can probably uh, uh, hand over to MC so that you know we close and come back again. Uh, on the same link sure. for uh, the final valediction. So, sure. uh, Professor Ajit, you can take over. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you all, Professor, uh, for your interactive and interesting panel of discussion <laughs> rather than formal q and uh, As we uh, come to the end of... Uh, anyway, Professor days, Ajit, just before that, I would like to mention to Professor Murthy, though there were not questions, plenty yes, of sir. people appreciated. Oh, yes. not <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead, uh, yes, Professor Ajit. As, as we have come to the end of the three-day online training program on fundamentals, fundamentals of disaster management, I request all professors and participants to join us for a validatory session. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Avinash, you all who are on the dignitaries. Okay. We will wait for a while, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Avinash, uh, okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, uh, Major General Nayak is there, uh, our principal also has joined. Uh, can you put him on the, yeah, okay. Uh, 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 sir, Professor Murthy and uh, uh, Professor Nayak, uh, Major General Nayak, let me introduce principal. our uh, principal. Uh, so principal, you are noted, sir. You know, he has been very instrumental for taking our institute to this height. And uh, 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 Sir uh, Professor Murthy belongs to IIT Madras. And uh, Major General Nayak, uh, you know, uh, uh, after his uh, work in the defense, he has been doing a lot of social work, especially in the area of uh, disaster management. He gave a wonderful lecture yesterday. And uh, today, as usual, Professor Murthy's lecture was uh, fabulous. So I just would like you people to interact, sir. Professor uh, Sadashiva Gowda. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's actually an honor uh, to have them, uh, as uh, distinguished speakers in our uh, workshops. Uh, because, uh, Professor Prasad always tells, you know, talks highly about uh, Professor Murthy and uh, Professor uh, Major General Nayak. Sure. In the inauguration, also, we, you know, he, you, you are, he mentioned. Uh, so I think we are really fortunate to have uh, both of you today in the valedictory function. And uh, you might have already heard of, uh, heard of our institute. And uh, Pro Professor Prasad is also contributing significantly for the growth of our institute since he joined uh, uh, more, more than a year ago. Uh, so we need uh, uh, advice from people like you, uh, you know, who have 
uh, who have been instrumental in the growth of many institutions, particularly in you know, IITs and all. They are all role models for us. Uh, so we are really fortunate to have all of you. So it is really nice, sir. Nice, uh, very happy moments for all of us. Thank you. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vashishta also has joined, sir. Joined director from uh, NIDM. Professor Chandan Ghosh, as usual, has been there. He had been there in the entire uh, three days program. So uh, uh, we, yeah. Uh, and uh, good, good, good morning, Dr. Dr. Gauda. And Murthy, sir, good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Naik, sir. Thank you so much. And, and as, as I was listening to you, a lot of ideas were coming to my mind. So I thought uh, these two, three minutes, I just wanted to convey one or two things uh, which you all you have told. So what uh, this link between uh, yesterday I was talking to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Prasad and you also told very directly that link between people who know and people who need that knowledge that is missing in our country because of grassroots mm -hmm. level. So you told so many things about that. So mm -hmm. what occurred to me is that uh, you must have, you very well know about the movement of National Cadet Corps. And yeah. uh, in within that, uh, in universities and colleges, we have some some appointment called ANOs, Associated yeah. 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 Officers. Yeah. So yeah. these are the people who, yeah. who explain yeah. the students, they are the teachers actually. Yeah. It's a part time yeah. job for them. Yeah. So yeah. now, if you have to, feel, to follow what you have been telling, Associated Disaster Management Teachers. In um, institute like what we in, in Mysore we are talking now or any big institute, then the one yeah. nodal person he is right. he can he can be a interface with what is happening outside world because people are within their own speciality, their own students, own curriculums, etc. And then yeah. come and coordinate things and they can tell the professor in civil engineering, look, this is what possibly they, they want or somebody in mechanical engineering, something like that. I thought this little idea. It needs uh, you know, Malay no, no, Wonderful thought, yeah. uh, Naik sir. Wonderful thought. It's an excellent thought. In fact, I'm uh, with you. I'll talk to uh, executive director NITM because they have yeah. a major outreach program for about 14, 15,000 crores. And yes. uh, Chandan Ghosh is here. He will tell us. And uh, as part of that outreach, I will recommend to him that we could identify um, one colleague from each institute to become yeah. the disaster management contact person. Uh, for that institute and disseminate all the um, information, messages, documents, books through that person in that college and also get feedback through that person. And uh, since sir, I have been to a lot of state capitals for doing mock exercises, basically for response, uh, as you know, I have been Gee. meeting you in NDMA very often. But uh, again, uh, some important people are missing from the mock exercises, thinking that it's a job of the administration. Like even yeah. we did a earthquake mock drill in Dehradun. Uh, now it's occurring to me the why GSI people, one or two representatives. I, we don't want the mm. head of department or boss of the organization. But one yeah. person who can come and see what the Dehradun government is doing, what they're talking about, earthquake response and mitigation and this and that. So he can go back to GSI and give a feedback. This is True. not happening. So Gee. academia as a part of day-to-day uh, -day activities, some refs must go. And this is not, uh, and it's not written anywhere. It's we go yes. to Secretary last man in Bengal or Karnataka. He'll take out the list and forget about he kisi college ke principal ko bula lete hain ya vice chancellor ko bula lete hain unko bolte hain kisi ko bhej dijiye. Yeah, this is both ways it has to work. And uh, rest this use of mitigation fund uh, uh, again related point I wanted to convey that uh, if there is a person in say engineering college and if all teachers, professors, they have to be knowing the local hazards and vulnerabilities. And based on that knowledge which they have here, they may not have money to implement it. They can go back with ideas to district administration or to state administration only to tell them, look, I know what is the problem. This is what can be done. And uh, yes. whether you do it or not, it's a simply different game. But here it is available and we can help. True. So that also is a missing link. I thought I'll just take two, three Gee, minutes. Gee. Perfect. I mean, these are thoughts I'll carry forward. Uh, Major General Bindal Lendano uh, NIDM. So I will talk to him yes. also about it and yes, uh, see yes. if we can interface it in their outreach program, national outreach program. Yes, yes. Thank yes. you, sir. Sir, sir. Bahan uh, Bhanku. Yes, sir. Uh, now we are in a validity session. Firstly, I welcome all the dignitaries to validity session on three day online training program on fundamentals of disaster management. So on this occasion, now I request Dr. C.B.R. Murthy, sir, to say a few words 
about the training program. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, disaster management is a subject that today cannot be looked away from by any academic institute in the country. And uh, disaster management cannot be done without the presence of all its three primary players, which is government, academia, and industry. And disaster management can happen only if we are able to bring together the advantages, the gains to the people at large at the grassroots level. I'm hoping that uh, in time to come, the modes in the colleges will change. And uh, as uh, Major General Nike has just mentioned, that we will identify at least one colleague in each institute to be the person who will be in charge of disseminating and undertaking mock drills and so on in the colleges, preparing a disaster management plan for the college uh, and uh, seek appropriate support from the local government for necessary improvements in the situation. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation. I'm uh, extremely grateful that uh, this uh, subject was taken up by Vidyavardhaka College of Engineering. It's absolutely uh, timely. And I hope that you'll continue to engage with this subject in time ahead. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your opinion. We request you to uh, continuously support for in future events also, sir. Sure. sure. Yes. Now I request our beloved HOD, Dr. S.K. Prasad, uh, Department of Civil Engineering, VVC Mysuru, to summarize the uh, three days online training program jointly organized by VPC and NADM. Over to you, sir. Yeah, yeah. So kindly permit me to, uh, you know, present through PPT. Uh, so I would like to share the screen. Has it been happening? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I hope my slides are visible. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, very quickly, I go through uh, the entire uh, three days program. So uh, the title of our online training program was Fundamentals of Disaster Management. 15th to 17th, we have covered. On 15th as well as 17th, we had three lectures each. And on the 16th, we had two lectures. Uh, uh, this is the fundamental thing, disaster management cycle, which has many components. And uh, uh, very clearly, uh, we showed that each one is very important. And especially civil engineers have big roles to play in most of these components. And we had the inauguration in which uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vashishta was there. And the management of uh, personnel of uh, uh, the Avardhaka College of Engineering Honorary Secretary, uh, uh, engineer Vishwanath, honorary president, Sri Gundapa Gowda were there. As usual, Dr. Sadashiva Gowda, who has been the uh, main backbone of all such activities, was also present. And uh, uh, Dr. Umesh made the vote of thanks. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the inaugural session. And the limelight of that was, you know, Professor Tauhata, who happened to be my advisor. Uh, during my PhD days at University of Tokyo, who also was there in the inaugural, and then he gave the first lecture. The first lecture uh, uh, was on geo hazards. The title he gave was Geo Disaster Management of Earthquakes, Floods, and Rainfall Induced Landslides. So, one thing he brought out based on his own analysis is that, you know, some uh, during 1970s and 2000, the magnitudes of earthquakes and earthquake energy released were considerably low. Before that, it was high and after 2000, it has increased. So he uh, didn't make any statement that, you know, earthquake magnitudes are increasing after 2000 for this reason or so, but he just brought out that during 1970s and uh, 2000, we were relatively uh, silent. The uh, earth was relatively silent. Also with respect to, uh, you know, the flood situation. He made that, uh, made sure to mention that, you know, Hitoyashi city was flooded up to almost this level. Okay. And the actual flood level was much, much greater than the design flood level. And uh, he showed that, you know, uh, this is the level up to which the water had risen during the flood in uh, July 2020. And uh, uh, he has the indications of that, you know, grass being collected on the uh, uh, top of the lamppost. Uh, he clearly mentioned that, you know, whenever we talk about life cycle cost, we should 
not simply blindly uh, you know look into initial cost so we have to focus on uh, you know maintenance cost and then uh, as has already been brought out by other uh, speakers also uh, we should also consider the damage during the disasters that also has to come into picture and hence you know uh, the life cycle cost should be the guiding uh, uh, force for uh, any uh, you know construction activity then we had uh, uh, lieutenant colonel uh, uh, dinesh chandra vashishta who is the joint director at nidm who mainly talked about the uh, bill uh, uh, disaster management bill and then he clearly mentioned that you know these are the seven pillars for uh, uh, disaster management uh, five in pre disaster phase and two in post disaster phase which we have to consider and majority of them civil engineers will have to be involved therefore you know these are all the important pillars we have to look into from the angle of civil engineering he also uh, you know correlated with the uh, present uh, pandemic situation and uh, uh, gave us uh, insight about disaster management on the same day first day we had uh, dr montu basu from terry school of advanced studies in new delhi he gave the concepts and basics of disaster uh, uh, as an introduction he defined disaster by different uh, uh, definition methods and uh, 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 you know clearly informed uh, uh, what is disaster what is hazard and then mentioned that you know different disasters major of them uh, 27% of uh, uh, the disasters uh, you know problematic ones are floods and also 24% goes to transport accidents and earthquakes of course are important but you know from the statistics he showed that you know 7% of the disasters are due to earthquake uh, he also mentioned that asia and africa are most vulnerable to disasters he also compared the present covid situation and mentioned uh, how it compares with the other disasters then we had on the second day two lectures one by professor uh, major uh, general dr naik who is uh, very much with us here and he talked about disaster mitigation and uh, he uh, clearly tried to define what is disaster mitigation and he mentioned that you know uh, Uh, there are some cases where you just cannot stop complete disaster you will have to persist with some problems like you know disease uh, loss of livelihood loss of shelter uh, sometimes drinking water but still you know you should be able to manage the things and uh, it's not like you know complete uh, prevention may not be a possibility and you will have to see how you can manage uh, uh, without uh, you know uh, closing the things and uh, he talked a lot about uh, again disaster management act uh, and also uh, natural disaster management plan and he also mentioned because we are civil engineers a lot of non structural and structural measures to be taken and he mentioned about some of the important structural measures to be taken where civil engineers will be involved the second lecture again was a very dynamic one by brigadier vinod datta he talked about risk vulnerability hazard and capacity and he gave lot of statistics about uh, uh, you know uh, where the disasters stand and how the disasters were previous years and how the disasters are during the recent times he very clearly mentioned of course some work has been done therefore the loss of life in india has considerably reduced however the infrastructural loss economic loss has considerably increased and that is where we also have to check so definitely loss of life is something we have to totally avoid and we are going ahead but there is scope for us to uh, enhance our uh, uh, work towards disaster management where we should also reduce the loss to the infrastructure so lot of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, statistics he provided and mentioned some of our uh, vulnerable cities uh, uh, like shimla to vijayawada madurai and so on and uh, he talked about uh, resource mapping uh today we had the first lecture by me uh, earthquake disaster uh, risk management i tried to compare three countries haiti india and japan and mention that you know we are better than haiti at this point of time in terms of disaster management however we are far far behind countries like japan 
which needs to be taken into account. And uh, I also mentioned that, uh, you know, generally civil engineers are comfortable with uh, vertically downward forces, static forces. And when it comes to horizontal dynamic force, whether it is due to earthquake, flood, hurricane, tsunami, we are a bit, uh, uh, you know, concerned. We are not uh, having that amount of confidence. And that is where we have to build ourselves. I, at this point of time, you know, remember what uh, uh, Professor Murthy, uh, the statement Professor Murthy made. He said that, uh, you know, uh, academicians play a very big role. And till you reach a professor skater, you are at, uh, you can consider yourself to be a trainee. And once you become a professor, it is your duty to uh, work for the country. And uh, you'll have to work in areas like this disaster management. I really appreciate and respect this statement. Uh, well, uh, also, you know, I just talked about a little of earthquake uh, resistant design philosophy. Then we had uh, uh, Professor Chandan Ghosh, who is always uh, flamboyant. He talked about urban flood. Yes, this is a matter of uh, serious concern. He mentioned, you know, there are simple solutions, to complicated problems. And uh, uh, there are uh, different ways you can handle, you can... Uh, really, uh, you know, control the uh, flooding water and perhaps, you know, you can also collect it for future use, different methods he mentioned, which is appreciable. He gave a clear idea about uh, uh, how the uh, cost of disasters uh, is happening to human uh, life loss and so on. And uh, different measures, very simple measures which we can take uh, to solve problems associated with uh, urban floods using flexi membranes. Uh, he also talked about the, uh, you know, uh, 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 trading name flood sacks and so on. Well, we purposely kept the last lecture uh, uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, CVR Murthy's lecture as the last lecture, because, you know, I always consider Professor Murthy to be, uh, you know, uh, something very special. And uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, common things between uh, uh, our former president uh, uh, Radhakshanan and uh, Professor Murthy. One very important common thing is both of them share the same birthday, 5th uh, September. So we had a flamboyant lecture as usual. He talked about disaster management, uh, disaster mitigation, and uh, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, focused on the disaster mit mitigation in India. Uh, explained to us very clearly about hazard, exposure, vulnerability, hazard versus disaster, risk. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, uh, he uh, really means that we have a lot of things to do from our side, uh, from the point of view of disaster management. And especially faculty members, teachers have bigger roles to play. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 any hazard can become a disaster provided we don't take extra care and risks are some things which we have to minimize. That was the major statement he made. And with that, we, I believe, had a wonderful uh, uh, three days uh, lectures, all extremely eminent speakers. And uh, I feel very honored that, uh, you know, the course went on very well. We had more than 800 registrations. And uh, uh, every time, you know, we had uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, views in uh, uh, each of these uh, uh, sessions. To make it more attractive, we also announced prizes. And uh, we'll be giving three prizes uh, uh, because, you know, based on the performance in the quizzes, we gave uh, around six questions each from each of the speakers. And uh, uh, we hope in about uh, uh, two to three days' time, you know, we should be able to uh, get the results and uh, announcement will be made. The results will come on the uh, website of uh, our institution. Uh, I need to thank many people in this regard because, you know, any uh, success of any event uh, like this, uh, many people will be responsible for that. Firstly, I'll have to thank NIDM in general, particularly Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, Executive Director. Lieutenant Colonel Vashishta, Joint Director, Professor Chandan Ghosh, then the uh, two important people who always remain at the backsta uh, backstage, Mr. Balaji and Mr. Dharmendra Yadav. 
i definitely have to thank my college management without whose support you know we cannot really think about uh, uh, you know uh, events like this uh, our honorary president shri gunda pagoda honorary vice president shri shivalingappa uh, honorary secretary engineer vishwanath honorary treasurer shri shaila ramannavar and of course our beloved principal professor sadashiva gowda then all the eight speakers professor tawhata from university of tokyo he is uh, professor emeritus there again lieutenant colonel vashishta joint director and idm dr montu basu uh, montu bos uh, terry uh, school of advanced studies new delhi uh, major general nayak uh, kirti chakra ashishta uh, ati vishishta uh, seva medal uh, and uh, former consultant in the ma then brigadier vinod datta uh, vinod datta former senior consultant and idm professor chandan bosh of nidm and professor cbr murthy of iit madras uh, my colleagues at uh, research studio this is one of the clubs of the department uh, we have three clubs uh, one we call as nirman another is stira club and third one is research studio so professor umesha who leads this club and he has been the main source of uh, 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 you know actions and activities professor kanmani professor manoj professor rajit professor raghavendra and uh, my young uh, uh, you know fellow uh, engineer avinash who is the assistant instructor in our uh, uh, department all my department colleagues at vidyavardha uh, uh, college of engineering and of course you know other technical staff from vvc as well as nidm participants then uh, all of us who have helped for the success of the online training program so with this i end my presentation i thank each one of you for the success of this online training program Uh, thank you, Prasad sir. Now I request uh, Lieutenant Colonel DC Vasista, Joint Director, NADM, Government of India, New Delhi, to express his opinion about the training program. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, sir, I would uh, uh, thank uh, Dr. C uh, C V R Murthy, sir. Sir, uh, welcome, sir, uh, to this session, sir. And we have never met, sir, though you had many times interacted in NADM. General Bindal used to talk about you, sir. so uh, thank you very much for gracing the occasion uh, and being part of this through vvc sir and it's a proud privilege to be in such a gathering wherein our, uh, i see uh, dr c r murthy uh, our uh, professor sk prasad and uh, general nayak then uh, uh, dr sadashiv gowda and of course our professor chandan ghosh from nidm sir and uh, um, i stand proud and i stand honored to be participating in this valediction session here uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to vvce for giving us a platform to uh, uh, basically make people aware on the fundamentals of disaster management though vvc has gone ahead and they have done a program earlier with nid but uh, this program was uh, quite unique since we have touched upon many fundamental aspects of disaster management which i feel that uh, the general masses the people the students the faculty members they should know how are we managing the disaster management uh, and what is, what are the guidelines which have we have received at uh, from ministry of home affairs at the central government level so thank you uh, sir uh, for uh, giving us this platform and uh, thank you very much uh, uh, we look forward to such programs in future and i must thank all the participants throughout these Three days who have participated in such uh, good strength and numbers. Uh, your YouTube channel, I've seen a lot of uh, hits, uh, more than uh, a lakh, which I was seeing on the first day, and then it increased on a daily basis. Thank you, sir, and thank you, uh, Dr. Sadashiv Gowda, sir. Uh, thank you, to Professor S K Prasad, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 everyone, for being part of this three days course. Thank you, uh, sir, and special thanks to our uh, Dr. C V R Murthy who has graced this occasion in this. Uh, Dr. V K Naik, sir, uh, our general, sir, he is a Kirti Chakra and A V S M. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, being part of uh, our programs always, sir, and you have uh, quite uh, occasion to be uh, listening to you and all. Uh, 
a moment, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, so much from the team and IDM here, and we look forward to such programs in future as well. Sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for your continued support and encouragement. And now I request a guest of honor, Major General Dr. B.K. Naik, sir, to say a few words about the program. Uh, sir, you are muted. Oh, sorry. Now I'm not mute. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this honor. I thought it was most befitting for Dr. Murthy or Professor Gorda to say a few words because so many students are listening and you are the best people to uh, tell so many good things to them. And I'm really honored. But uh, first of all, I must congratulate NIDM for uh, the outreach that is uh, the going to specific institutions and uh, like I should not be telling you about the a, a nuclear chain reaction. Uh, this is the impact we are going to have in uh, our, our, our population, our communities with every student understands uh, NIDM to a couple of colleges, to a couple of professors, to a couple of students. And uh, that is what is a very good thing which is uh, happening. And uh, with this thought, since one of the uh, technical institutions involved and Professor Murthy also spoke of a uh, kind of uh, comprehensive book uh, whereas a lot of knowledge is already available on NIDM sites and all uh, and NDMA sites. So I thought that uh, it will be a good idea uh, now to go with uh, specific content that is uh, like in army we ask a question so what? So what is a question I would look for answers. So here is the whole knowledge of civil engineering there is so knowledge of whole knowledge of mechanical engineering or space uh, whatever ISRO does the whole knowledge is there and here is a disaster like an earthquake uh, like, like a tsunami or like a cyclone so what so so what ask a question to yourself and you say i should be doing a b c d in my capacity as a professor in my capacity as a scientist or in my capacity as a citizen or my capacity as a student so that is what uh, is to be done and i was talking about the book so i i started from there so now if you come out uh, for a book specifically for civil engineers how disasters relate to their discipline and what is expected out of them and that much otherwise uh, we may end up doing a lot of general general books which are already there uh, that is what i want to give example of civil engineering only whereas every discipline of science is linked with that so that's a small message i wanted to give and it's a very good um, very good procedure very good system and nodal officers, uh, nodal professors, disaster management, uh, you, we don't have to wait for any government to come. Now, this college, we're doing it. Uh, Gona Sahib can appoint one, I'll say junior professor. It will give you greater uh, yield because he'll have a little more time and he should be doing the needful, taking uh, feed from everyone. And he should be your nodal officer for uh, updating everybody on civil engineering or what is happening in the world. If a building hasn't collapsed in Germany or Japan or California, oh, and it is collapsed in India. What is the difference? That only civil engineers or structural engineers or architects, architects can tell. And I, being a layman, and in army also, uh, infantry is. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not in that educated category where we have a lot of engineers, a lot of scientists. Um, our DRD is having tons of knowledge. So we are infantry. We are we are the people who fight at the front. So we have different kind of knowledge, and that is being too blunt, but. Uh, I thought a specific knowledge has to be uh, carried forward and specific books will be required now. And uh, one more thing, which is uh, uh, the the one message I wanted to convey. I don't know whether right, it is the right platform or not. We are very senior people here. But for students, it will make a difference, I suppose. Uh, apart from all knowledge, uh, scientific knowledge, the value system has to continue. Uh, a couple of slides shown by Dr. Murthy at the end kindly relate to the incident which happened yesterday, heart of Bombay, um, Kurla, Kurla complex and a, a bridge under construction has come down. When you make a, a design on the blackboard in your colleges, you know why it will come down, why it will stand. So that is what, to my mind, there are some gaps somewhere in our system now. This about 34 people are injured, some there is loss of finances and uh, there is some lost to the nation in, in, in a broader sense and hundreds of events happen so our value system also has to be part of our education which is indeed there so i thought just hint at that and leave it 
because uh, this may be is not a platform to be uh, talking of uh, so many other things which are also relevant and thank you so much uh, uh, dr gauda and uh, dr prasad i have i have learned a lot uh, by by listening to all the lectures and uh, i i'll be very happy to help anyone and uh, i am retired and i can i can i have a lot of time thank you so much uh, thank you sir uh, it's a great honor to have you on this occasion and we will look forward to your collaboration with you sir thank you so much sir now i request uh, dr chandan ghosh professor in nidm new delhi to say a few words about the program over to you sir yeah uh, just only few words i would like to say because all the three days we are together and it is a excellent way of uh, taking it to the academia and research and also uh, indicating that the what are the what are the projects or what are the work that they have to be carried out as professor mufti also uh, elaborated about the grants that where it is available and moreover the uh, urgency for uh, collating the civil engineering or engineering specific uh, uh, say knowledge and know how as a textbook item for the engineering uh education and curricula uh, would be the immediate task to be looked into by the academia and researchers together so i want to just convey this much thank you thank you so much sir for your uh, because of you only we, we were able to conduct the two programs so thank you once again now i request uh, our beloved principal dr b sadashiva gowda sir to say few words about the program over to you sir yeah thank you so much uh, good afternoon to all the distinguished uh, persons uh, particularly professor cvr murthy uh, major general dr vk nayak we have professor chandan ghosh uh, lieutenant colonel vasista and uh, professor sk prasad uh, the professor and head of civil engineering and dr umesh and all my colleagues and all the participants and um, you know i was there for the inauguration and when i looked at the number of views as uh, professor sk prasad mentioned you know it is more than 1000 for each of the sessions that have been conducted by the various resource persons uh, you know obviously that speaks volumes about the quality of resource persons and their presentations and as uh, 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 major general nayak mentioned that we should have a, a nodal officer from our institute to coordinate various disasters uh, management uh, particularly in the local uh, environment in the state and of course at the country level in fact very near to our institute we have kur uh, it is the you know the the city where we have madikeri where we had last night due to a heavy rainfall a uh, one year ago thousands of people were affected i think uh, this is very important that the nidm and uh, the local institutes collaborate in a meaningful way to mitigate and also create awareness because there was huge loss of uh, lives uh, both human and also the uh, the cattle were lost during those floods and the landslides i think it is important that uh, you know we create awareness if you have uh, nodal officers who create awareness within the institute and they will become a licensed officer between the institute and outside world uh, which very is a very uh, important suggestion we definitely take it positively and we will ensure that uh, that is implemented in our institute sir and uh, secondly this kind of collaborations uh, definitely we get lot of inputs from such uh, distinguished people Uh, so it will definitely take uh, you know our institute to a much greater heights and uh, we believe that there are many disasters that are happening in and around our uh, institute in our own state it is important that we create awareness how we those can be mitigated uh, because we believe that you know we create engineers many a time uh, they don't uh, you know they even though they are able to see they don't observe those things and then find suitable solutions to those problems uh, so we have we should be able to forecast mitigate 
and uh, find solutions to those problems and uh, the younger generation have the ability have the competencies to find solutions but uh, many a time we as a teachers fail to create curiosity uh, that kind of uh, uh, interest amongst the students to uh, to observe these things that happens in the nature and then mitigate those things so definitely we are all the you know the the distinguished uh, speakers whatever the suggestion that have been given will definitely help us to improve uh, the domain knowledge in the fundamentals of disaster management in our students and also amongst all the participants because the participants participants have come from all over india obviously they are going to impact uh, their institutes in various ways just like how you are impacting our institute similarly they are going to impact their institute uh, so that uh, no at the national level there would be a movement where we would be able to mitigate the disasters uh, it should become a kind of a movement for all of us because we have seen uh, the impact of disasters and the consequences of disasters uh, on the national economy so with this i once again uh, thank all the distinguished speakers and also i would like to congratulate the department of civil engineering and uh, i would like to thank nidm for their continued support to organize this kind of training in association with vvc and uh, so i thank all the participants on behalf of vidyavadaka college of engineering for their continued support in registering and also uh, listening to all the talks and i hope that this knowledge is passed on to the student community thereby the entire country gets the benefits of all the talks that have been delivered by the distinguished speakers so thank you once again so have a great day thank you sir uh, because of the your encouragement only we could able to conduct this type of events so thank you once again now i request our professor uh, kanmani ss department of civil engineering to propose vote of thanks over to kanmani madam yeah thank you thank you rajit sir and uh, before uh, going for order thanks i think umesh sir would like to tell something umesh sir yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i think ahead, all sir. this uh, yeah yeah um, good afternoon to everyone so the, this uh, lecture on fundamentals of um, uh, disaster management it will be very useful for our faculties students practicing engineers throughout the country so i would like to take that one thank you very much for uh, all your support and it is will really be useful thank you thank you very much thank you. thank you sir okay. thank you sir thank you sir uh, i'll take over the session now uh, before giving a formal vote of thanks i would like to tell few things to our participant friends a small but of course a very important note to you people that uh, the winners of quiz event will be announced on 20th september 2021 in the official website of our college vvce.ac.in i repeat vvce.ac.in and don't forget to give your valuable feedback at nidm portal to get your certificate at the end of the program and for more information on if you have any more queries please contact us at rscivil at vvce.ac.in and uh, now let me go to the vote of thanks a formal vote of thanks it was really a great pleasure to propose a vote of thanks in this special occasion and that too after such a beautiful presentation by dr cvrm sir uh, it's always very great to listen to a best teacher of the country dr cvr murthy sir explaining the elements of risk and giving awareness to our young india about the importance of risk and how to handle through six pillars like prevention mitigation preparedness response rehabilitation and reconstruction uh, we are very proud and happy to listen to you sir and on behalf of my department and nidm team and on on the on behalf of the entire participants who are looking now so i would like to render my heartfelt thanks to the gem of structural engineering dr cvrm sir thank you sir thank you for gracing the occasion uh in this special occasion of valedictory function of fundamentals of disaster management let me thank all those who supported behind and on the screen for the grand success of this event first let me thank the joint director of the prestigious national institute of disaster management lieutenant colonel uh, dinesh chandra vashishta sir 
without his support and able leadership it, it would not be possible to take this event towards a success uh, in his absence because he went for some important me meeting in his absence uh, we are very thankful sir very thankful to you thank you so much and uh, i also thank a person from nidm who is very close to vvc family dr chandan go sir who is the key behind collaborating with nidm team thank you so much sir and uh, my heartfelt thanks to the guest of honor the the speaker major general dr vk nayak sir kirti chakra avsm former senior consultant for being so kind to us and gracing this occasion thank you so much sir and i thank honorable management members uh, shri gundappa gowda sir president shri p vishwanath sir honorable secretary and shri shri shaila ramana nawar sir treasurer of vidyavardhaka sangha for supporting and giving full freedom to us to conduct such event in college thank you sir and i thank the main pillar of vidyavardhaka college of engineering leader of such a cohesive teamwork of faculty members in the campus our beloved principal dr b sadashivay gowda sir for his continuous motivation in conducting events thank you sir uh, i thank dean academics dr uh, hs dhananda sir dean research and development dr gbk sir for supporting in conduction of such events and i thank the backbone of civil engineering department most supportive and encouraging uh, head ever our beloved hod dr sk prasad sir uh, for organizing such events and for being our strength in the department thank you sir uh, i also thank uh, the most hard working person of the department our research studio chairman dr umesha pk sir former chief scientist of acrc for being there at all time with us leading us in every part each and each and every part of the program thank you sir uh, i thank engineer balaji a gis developer and uh, mr dharmender yadav developer coordinators from nidm uh, for their excellent coordination and support throughout the program thank you thank you sir and uh, i thank our organizing committee members professor shilpa bs professor uh, girish p and all the staffs and students of the department of civil engineering for timely work completion and for being with us always thank you uh, i must thank uh, our uh, mr avinash uk and mr pushkin for being the technical strength behind this program and i thank uh, all the coordinators uh, from our end that is professor uh, raguendra s yes, sanganaikar Uh, professor rajit tj professor manoj p for their continuous help and coordination throughout the program and at last but not the least i thank each of the participant friends for gracing the occasion hope you all people got benefit uh, and uh, kindly don't forget to give you give your valuable feedback also thank you all once again for gracing the occasion of three day online program on fundamentals of disaster management eight beautiful innova uh, innovative and informative sessions and uh, eight very resourceful speakers thank you thank you all over to you rajit sir thank you kanmani madam our uh, dear participants and oh, one more thing sir sir i i would like to thank uh, professor kanmani for his uh, uh, continuous uh, work in throughout this one i think uh, thank you thank without her i think it would not be like this okay thank you thank you very thank much. You so much thank you yes sir. Uh, dear participants, okay. as made mention, the quiz results will be announced in BBC website on 20th September. Uh, for such programs, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel BBC Official. Uh, with this announcement, I Rajit is signing off of matter of ceremony for this session. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. A big thank you on behalf of Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal and IDM to entire team with the Vardhaka Engineering College. Thank you, sir. Thank you. thank you so much for a thank wonderful thank you very much sir uh, thank you it's an entire team i have it is naming is not that it is an entire team work that you have been rendering for the last so many days so from our side we are really thankful uh, uh, going towards south uh, uh, bringing an idms aura towards south through you and of course uh, throughout the india thank you thank you very thank much you. and thank you professor murthy we are really thank honored thank you thank major you. general naik uh, really honored we will connect with you all uh, and try to do whatever best possible and my sincere yeah. thanks to my principal professor sadashiva gowda for giving all the encouragement support thank you, thank thank you, you all thank you all thank you all thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. okay